I believe you were once temporarily suspended uh, from Twitter due to an internal error yourself. We do not want to lose sight of a few fundamental facts. Humans are building the algorithms. Humans are making decisions about how to implement Twitter's terms of service, and humans are recommending changes to Twitter's policies. Humans can make mistakes. And how Twitter manages those circumstances is critically important in an environment where algorithms are set up to decide what we see in our home feed, ads, and search suggestions on. It is critical that users are confident that you're living up to your own promises. According to Twitter rules, the company believes that everyone should have the power to create and share ideas and information instantly without barriers. Well, that's a noble mission and one that is private company you certainly do not have to take on. The fact that you have done so has enriched the world, changed society, has given an outlet to voices that might otherwise never be heard. We in the American people want to be reassured that you're continuing to live up to that mission. We hope you can help us better understand how Twitter decides when to suspend a user or ban them from the service and what you do to ensure that such decisions are made without undue bias. We hope you can help us better understand what role automated algorithms have in this process and how those algorithms are designed to ensure consistent outcomes and a fair process. The company that you and your co-founders created plays an instrumental role in sharing news and information across the globe. We appreciate your willingness to appear before us today and to answer our questions. With that, I yield back the balance of my time and recognize Mr. Pallone from New Jersey for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the past few weeks, President Trump and many Republicans have peddled conspiracy theories about Twitter and other social media platforms to whip up their base and fundraise. I fear the Republicans are using this hearing for those purposes instead of addressing the serious issues raised by social media platforms that affect Americans' everyday lives. Twitter is a valuable platform for disseminating news, information, and viewpoints. It can be a tool for bringing people together and allows one to reach many. In places like Iran and Ukraine, Twitter was used to organize and give voice to the concerns of otherwise voiceless individuals. Closer to home, Twitter and hashtags like Stay Woke, Me Too, and Net Neutrality have fostered important conversations and supported larger social movements that are changing our society. But Twitter has a darker side. Far too many Twitter users still face bullying and trolling attacks. Tweets designed to threaten, belittle, demean, and silence individuals can have a devastating effect, sometimes even driving people to suicide. And while Twitter has taken some steps to protect users and enable reporting, more needs to be done. Bad actors have co-opted Twitter and other social media platforms to spread disinformation and sow divisions in our society. For example, Alex Jones used Twitter to amplify harmful and dangerous lies, such as those regarding the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Others have used the platform to deny the existence of the Holocaust, disseminate racial supremacy theories, and spread false information about terrorism, natural disasters, and more. When questioned about this disinformation, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey said the truth will win out in the end, but there is reason to doubt that, in my opinion. According to a recent study published by the MIT Media Lab, false rumors on Twitter traveled, and I quote, farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth, with true claims taking about six times as long to reach the same number of people. And that's dangerous. And countries like Russia and Iran are taking advantage of this to broadly disseminate propaganda and false information. Beyond influencing elections, foreign agents are actively trying to turn groups of Americans against each other. And these countries are encouraging conflict to sow division and hatred by targeting topics that generate intense feelings, such as race, religion, and politics. Unfortunately, the actions of President Trump have made the situation worse. Repeatedly, the president uses Twitter to bully and belittle people, calling them names like dog, clown, spoiled brat, son of a bitch, enemies, and loser. He routinely tweets false statements designed to mislead Americans and foster discord. And the president's actions course in the public debate and feed distrust within our society. President Trump has demonstrated that the politics of division are good for fundraising and rousing his base, and sadly, Republicans are now following his lead instead of criticizing the president for behavior that would not be tolerated even from a child. As reported in the news, the Trump campaign and the Republican majority leader have used the supposed anti-conservative bias online to fundraise. This hearing appears to be just one more mechanism to raise money and generate outrage and it appears Republicans are desperately trying to rally their base by fabricating a problem that simply does not exist. 
Regardless of the Republic's intentions for this hearing, Twitter and other social media platforms must do more to regain and maintain the public trust. Bullying, the spread of disinformation, and malicious foreign influence continue. Twitter policies have been inconsistent and confusing. The company's enforcement seems to chase the latest headline as opposed to addressing systematic problems. Though Twitter and other social media platforms must establish clear policies to address the problems discussed today, provide tools to users, and then swiftly and fairly enforce those policies. And those policies should apply equally to the president, politicians, administration officials, celebrities, and the teenager down the street. It's long past time for Twitter and other social media companies to stop allowing their platforms to be tools of discord, of spreading false information, and of foreign government, foreign government manipulation. So I thank you for having the hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. The uh, chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Dorsey for purposes of an opening statement. We appreciate your being here, and feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Walden, Ranking Member Plun, and the committee for the opportunity to speak on behalf of Twitter to the American people. I look forward to our conversation about our commitment to impartiality to transparency, and to accountability. If it's okay with all of you, I'd like to read you something I personally wrote as I thought about these issues. And I'm also going to tweet it out right now. I want to start by making something very clear. We don't consider political viewpoints, perspectives, or party affiliation in any of our policies or enforcement decisions, period. Impartiality is our guiding principle. Let me explain why. We believe many people use Twitter as a digital public square. They gather from all around the world to see what's happening and have a conversation about what they see. Twitter cannot rightly serve as a public square if it's constructed around the personal opinions of its makers. We believe a key driver of a thriving public square is the fundamental human right of freedom of opinion and expression. Our early and strong defense of open and free exchange has enabled Twitter to be the platform for activists, marginalized communities, whistleblowers, journalists, governments, and the most influential people around the world. Twitter will always default to open and free exchange. A default to free expression left unchecked can generate risks and dangers for people. It's important Twitter distinguishes between people's opinions and their behaviors, and disarms behavior intending to silence another person or adversely interfere with their universal human rights. We build our policies and rules with a principle of impartiality, objective criteria, rather than on the basis of bias, prejudice, or preferring, or preferring the benefit to one person over another for improper reasons. If we learn we fail to create impartial outcomes, we immediately work to fix. In the spirit of accountability and transparency, recently we failed our intended impartiality. Our algorithms were unfairly filtering 600,000 accounts, including some members of Congress, from our search autocomplete and latest results. We fixed it, but how did it happen? Our technology was using a decision-making criteria that considers the behavior of people following these accounts. We decided that wasn't fair, and we corrected it. We'll always improve our technology and algorithms to drive healthier usage and measure the impartiality of those outcomes. Bias in algorithms is an important topic. Our responsibility is to understand, measure, and reduce accidental bias due to factors such as the quality of the data used to train our algorithms. This is an extremely complex challenge facing everyone applying artificial intelligence. For our part, machine learning teams at Twitter are experimenting with these techniques and developing roadmaps to ensure present and future machine learning models uphold a high standard when it comes to algorithmic fairness. It's an important step towards ensuring impartiality. 
Looking at the data, we analyzed tweets sent by all members of the House and Senate and found no statistically significant difference between the number of times a tweet by a Democrat is viewed versus a Republican, even after all of our ranking and filtering of tweets has been applied. Also, there's a distinction we need to make clear. When people follow you, you've earned that audience. And we have a responsibility to make sure they can see your tweets. We do not have a responsibility, nor you a right, to amplify your tweets to an audience that doesn't follow you. What our algorithms decide to show in shared spaces, like search results, is based on thousands of signals that constantly learn and evolve over time. Some of those signals are engagement. Some are the number of abuse reports. We balance all of these to prevent gaming our system. We acknowledge the growing concern people have of the power held by, by companies like Twitter. We believe it's dangerous to ask Twitter to regulate opinions or be the arbiter of truth. We'd rather be judged by the impartiality of outcomes and criticized when we fail this principle. In closing, when I think of our work, I think of my mom and dad in St. Louis, a Democrat and a Republican. We had lots of frustrating and, heat, frustrated, frustrating and heated debates, but looking back, I appreciate I was able to hear and challenge different perspectives. And I also appreciate I felt safe to do so. We believe Twitter helps people connect to something bigger than themselves, show all the amazing things that, hap that are happening in the world, and all the things we need to acknowledge and address. We're constantly learning how to make it freer and healthier for all to participate. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. We'll now begin uh, the opportunity to have questions, and I'll lead off. So, Mr. Dorsey, I want to get straight to the heart of why we're here today. We have a lot of questions about Twitter's business practices, including questions about your algorithms, content management practices, and how Section 230 Safe Harbor protect Twitter. In many ways, for some of us, it seems a little bit like the Wizard of Oz. We want to know what's going on behind the curtain. This summer, reports surfaced that prof uh, profiles of prominent Republican Twitter users were not appearing in automatically populated drop-down search results. I think you mentioned that in your own testimony. This was after a member of this committee um, had her tweets and ads uh, taken off the service because of basic conservative message, and then there are other examples that have been sent our way. Twitter's public response is, and I quote, we do not shadow ban. You're always able to see the tweets from accounts you follow, although you may have to, quote, do more work to find them, like go directly to their profile, close quote. But to most people, they might think of that as shadow banning. Because it doesn't matter what your definition of shadow banning is when the expectation you are given to your users who choose to follow certain accounts is different from what they see on their timeline and in their searches. In one example of many, certain prominent conservative users, including some of our colleagues uh, who have come to us, Representative Meadows, Jordan, Gates, were not shown in the automatically populated drop-down searches on Twitter, correct? Out of the more than 300 million active Twitter users, why did this only happen to certain accounts? In other words, what did the algorithm take into account that led to prominent conservatives, including members of the U.S. House of Representatives, not being included in auto search suggestions? What caused that? Thank you for the question. So we, um, we use signals, um, usually hundreds of signals, to determine and to decide what to show uh, what to downrank or potentially what to filter. In this particular case, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, we were using a signal of the uh, behavior of the people following accounts. And we didn't believe uh, upon further consideration and also seeing the impact, which was about 600,000 accounts, a pretty broad base, that that was ultimately fair, uh, and we decided to correct it. We also decided uh, that it was not fair to use a signal for filtering in general. And we decided to correct that within search as well. And it is important for us to, one, be able to experiment freely with these signals and to have the, um, to have the freedom to be able to inject them and also to remove them, because that's the only way we're going to learn. We will make mistakes along the way, 
And the way we want to be judged is making sure that we recognize those and that we correct them. And what we're looking in terms of, for in terms of whether we made a mistake or not is this principle of impartiality and specifically impartial outcomes. And we realized that in this particular case and within search that we weren't driving that and right. we could have done a better job there. L let me ask you another question. Could bots game the system and work to block or silence certain voices, political or otherwise? We, we are always looking for patterns of behavior uh, intending to amplify information um, artificially. And that information could include actions like blocking. So that's why it's important that we don't just use one signal, but we use hundreds of signals and that we balance them accordingly. Uh, there is a perception that a simple report of a term of a violation of a terms of service will result in action or downranking. That is not true. It is one signal that we use and right. weigh according to other signals that we see across the network. I, I have one final question. I asked followers of Twitter, or Twitter followers I have, and one from Oregon asked why Twitter relies exclusively on users to report violations. Uh, this is a matter of scale. So today, in order to remove tweets or to remove accounts, we do require a report of the violation. And that report is reviewed by an individual. Those reports are prioritized based on the severity of the report. So death threats have a higher prioritization than all others, and we take action on them much faster. We do have algorithms that are constantly proactively searching the network and specifically the behaviors on the network and filtering and downranking accordingly. And what that means in terms of filtering is it might filter behind an interstitial. An interstitial is a graphic or element within our app or service that one can tap to see more tweets or show more replies. So in some cases, we are proactively, based on these algorithms, hiding some of the content, causing a little bit more friction to actually see it. And again, those are models that we constantly learn from and, my, and my evolve time as well. Has expired. Now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Twitter's effect on American society raises genuine and serious issues, but that's not why the Republican majority has called you here today, Mr. Dorsey. I think it's the height of hypocrisy that President Trump and congressional Republicans criticize Twitter for a supposed liberal bias when President Trump uses the platform every day for his juvenile tweets and spreading lies and mis misinformation to the whole country and to the world. In my opinion, you have an obligation to ensure your platform, at a minimum, does no harm to our country, our democracy, and the American public. And as I noted in my opening, one persistent critique of Twitter by civil rights advocates and victims of, of abuse and others is that your policies are unevenly enforced. The rich and powerful get special treatment. Others get little recourse when Twitter fails to protect them unless the company gets some bad press. Now, you've admitted that Twitter needs to do a better job explaining how decisions are made, especially those by human content moderators who handle the most difficult and sensitive questions. So let me just ask you, how many human content moderators does Twitter employ in the U.S., and how much do they get paid? Okay. We, um, so we, we want to think about this problem not in terms of the number of people, but how we make decisions to invest in building new technologies well, versus hiring folks. Well, let me ask you these three questions on this point, and then if you can answer it, I'd appreciate it. If you can't, uh, through the chairman, if you could get back to us. The first one was, how many human content moderators does Twitter employ in the U.S., and how much do they get paid? Second, how many hours of training is given to them to ensure consistency in their decisions? And last, are they given specific instructions to ensure that celebrities and politicians are treated the same as everyone else? If you can answer, otherwise I'm going to ask you to get back to us in writing, because well, I... We'll follow up with you on specific numbers, um, but on the last point, uh, this is a very important distinction. I do believe that we need to do more uh, around protecting private individuals um, than public figures. Um, I don't know yet exactly how that will manifest, but I do believe it's important that we extend the protection of our rules more to private individuals necessarily than public figures. Well, I appreciate that because I think everyone should be treated the same, and you seem to be saying that, but we have to make sure that the enforcement mechanism is there, so that's true. Uh, all right, then let me, let me ask um, if you could report back to the committee within one month 
of what steps Twitter is taking to improve the consistency of its enforcement and the metrics that demonstrate improvement, if you could, within a month. Is that okay? All right. Now, let me turn to another issue. I only have a minute. Other technology companies like Airbnb and Facebook have committed to conducting civil rights audits amid concerns raised by members of the Congressional Black Caucus and others, including representatives Rush to my left, Butterfield and Clark on our committee. And these audits seek to uncover how platforms and their policies have been used to stoke racial and religious resentment or violence. And given the sometimes dangerous use of your platform and the haphazard approach of Twitter towards developing and enforcing its policies, I think your company should take similar action. So let me ask these three questions. And again, if you can answer them, if not, please get back to us within a month. Will you commit to working with an independent third-party institution to conduct a civil rights audit of Twitter, yes or no? Uh, we, we will, and we, we do do that in an, on a regular basis with what's called a Trust and Safety Council. Which All right, but I mean, I would like asking for an independent third-party institution to conduct it. Yeah, let us follow up with you on that. All right. Second, will you commit, let me ask these two together, will you commit to making the results of all such audits available to the public, including all recommendations and findings? Yes, we, we do believe we need a lot more transparency around our actions and our decisions. All right, then the third one, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, will you commit, based on the findings of all such audits, to change Twitter's policies, programs, and processes to address these areas of concern, yes or no? We, we're always looking to evolve our policies based on what we find, so yes. All right, and again, Mr. Chairman, through you, if we could get uh, a report back to the committee within one month of the steps that Mr. Dorsey is taking, I would appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now turn to uh, Mr. Upton, former chairman of the committee, for uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Dorsey, I think it's fair to say that uh, even looking at my Twitter feed, that there are some fairly ugly things uh, on Twitter that come every now and then. And my name is Fred Upton, and I got to bet that my initials are probably used more than just about any other. Uh, might even think that it's bipartisan on both sides of the aisle. Um, uh, but I would like to see civility brought back into the public discourse. And in a July post, uh, Twitter acknowledged that tweets from bad faith actors who intend to manipulate or divide the conversations should be ranked lower. So the question is, how do you determine whether a user is tweeting to manipulate or divide the conversation? This is a great question and, and one that we have uh, we've struggled with in the past. Um, we recently determined that we needed something much more tangible and cohesive in order to think about this work. And we've come across um, health as a concept. And we've all had experiences where we felt we've been in a conversation that felt a little bit more toxic and we wanted to walk away from it. We've all been in conversations that felt really empowering and something that we're learning from and we want to stay in them. So right now we're trying to determine what the indicators of conversational health are. And we're starting with four indicators. One is what is the amount of shared attention that a conversation has? What percentage of the conversation is focused on the same things? What is a percentage of shared facts that the conversation is having? Not whether the facts are true or false, but are we sharing the same facts? What percentage of the conversation is receptive? And finally, is there a variety of perspective within the conversation or is it a filter bubble or echo chamber of the same sort of ideas? So we are currently trying to figure out what those indicators of health are and measure them. And we intend not only to share what those indicators are that we found, but also to measure ourselves against it and make that public so we can show progress. Because we don't believe we can really fix anything unless we can, we can measure it. And we're working with external parties to help us do that because we know we can't do this alone. So do you believe that Twitter's rules are clear on what's allowed and what's not allowed on the platform? I believe if you were to go to our rules today and sit down with a cup of coffee, you would not be able to understand that. I believe we need to do a much better job, not only with those rules, but with our terms of service. We need to make them a whole lot more approachable. Um, we would love to lead in this area and we are working on this, but. I think there's a lot of um, I think there's a lot of confusion around uh, our rules and also our enforcement, and we intend to fix it. The last question is: uh, Can a Twitter user's friend or someone that they follow grant permission 
to access to that user's personal information to a third party? No. Uh, we, you, if you are sharing your password uh, of your account with another, then they have the rights that you would have uh, to take on with that account. You'll back. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. Ms. Gett is next. Okay, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Ms. Gett. We're going by the order we were given. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dorsey, thank you so much for joining us here today because these are important issues. And even though the Democrats um, have highlighted uh, so the, that, that really some of the reasons why you came are, uh, we think, are are political and wrong. Nonetheless, there are some real issues with Twitter that I think we can discuss today. And, um, and as you said, Twitter really has become a tool for engagement across society. And recently, we saw some of its positive social change with the role it's played in the Me Too movement. But, um, but nonetheless, Twitter has also experienced its own sexual harassment problem to confront. And I just wanted to ask you some questions about how Twitter is dealing with these issues. I don't know if you're aware, Mr. Dorsey, of the Amnesty International report called Toxic Twitter, a toxic place for women. Are you aware of that? I am aware of it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put that in the record. Without objection. Um, now, now, in that report, it described the issues women face on Twitter and how Twitter could change to be more friendly to women. Um, I assume you've talked to Amnesty International about this report and about some of their recommendations. Um, I'm not sure if uh, I haven't personally, but I imagine that folks on our team have, but we can follow up with you. Thank you. The report goes into great and frankly graphic detail of the types of abuses that have been used, experienced on Twitter, including threats of rape, bodily harm, and death. Now, some were found, have found to violate Twitter's guidelines, but others were not. And I think probably you and your staff agree that Twitter needs to do a better job of addressing instances where some of the users are, are using the platform to harass and threaten others. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can tell me, does Twitter currently have data on reports of abusive conduct, including on the basis of race, religion, gender, or orientation, targeted harassment, or threats of violence? And separately, does Twitter have uh, data on the actions that it has taken to address these complaints? So a, a few things here. First and foremost, we, we don't believe that we can create a digital public square for people if they don't feel f safe to participate in, in the first place. And that is our number one and singular objective as a company is to increase the health of this public space. We do have data on um, all violations that we have seen across the platform and the context of those violations. And we do intend, um, and, and this will be an initiative this year, uh, to create a transparency report that will Thank make you. that data more public um, so that all can learn from it and we can also be public, uh, held publicly accountable to it. That's, that's, that's good news. And you, you say you'll have that this year yet? By the We're end. working on it as an initiative this year. We have a lot of work to do to aggregate all the data into a, a report that will be meaningful. And, and is Twitter also taking, taking actions to address some of the deficiencies that have been identified in this report and in other places? We are. We, we, we definitely, um, we're, we're focusing, one other th point I wanted to make is that we don't feel it's fair that the victims of abuse and harassment have to do the work to report it. Yes. Today our system does work on reports, especially when it has to take content down. So abuse reports is a metric that we would look at, not as something that we want to go up because it's easier to report things, but as something we want to go down, not only because we think that we can, re we can reduce the amount of abuse, but we can actually create technology to recognize it before people have to do the reporting to themselves. Recognize it and take it down before a report has to be made. Yes, uh, any series of enforcement actions all the way to the, to the extreme of it, which is 
removing content. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to say for the record, I don't think these issues are unique to Twitter. Um, unlike so many of the invented borderline conspiracy theories, I believe this is a real threat, and I appreciate you, Mr. Dorsey, taking this seriously and your entire organization so that we can uh, really reduce these threats online. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. General Lee yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, uh, for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Dorsey, first of all, go cards. Um, I'm from the St. Louis metropolitan area, and be careful of Colin behind you, who has uh, been known to be in this committee room a couple times. So uh, we're glad to have him back. The um, while, um, and I want to go to my questions, and then hopefully have time for a little summation. The while listening to users is important. How can anyone be sure that standards about what quote unquote distracts or distorts? are being handled fairly and consistently. And the follow-up is, doesn't this give power to the loudest mob and ultimately fail to protect controversial speech? Yeah, so um, this goes back to that framework I was discussing around health. And I, again, I don't, I don't know if those are the right indicators yet. That's why we are looking for outside help to make sure that we're doing the right work. But we should have an understanding and a measurement a tangible measurement of our effects on our system. And specifically in, in these cases, we're looking for behaviors that try to artificially amplify information and game our systems. And some ways that might happen. Would you consider, I'm sorry to interrupt, but a bot would be, you would consider that is manipulating the system, right? If, if a bot is used for manipulating the conversation and the what way about, we- What about if users band together um, would that be a man, you would consider manipulation? The, the, the same, and, and that's why it makes this issue complicated, is because sometimes we see bots, sometimes we see human coordinations in order to manipulate. Thank you. Um, the, um, Twitter has a verification program where users can be verified by Twitter as legitimate, and verified users have a blue check mark next to their name on their page. How does the review process for designating verified users align with your community guidelines or standards? Well, to be very frank, uh, our verification program right now is not where we like it to be, and uh, we do believe it is in serious need of a reboot and a reworking. And it has a long history. It started as a way to verify um, that the CDC account was the actual CDC account. Mm -hmm. Uh, during uh, the swine flu. And we broadened it um, without as many principles, strong principles as we needed, and then we opened the door to everyone. And unfortunately, that has caused some issues because the verified badge also um, is a signal that is used in some of our algorithms to rank higher or um, to uh, inject within um, shared areas of the service. That was my next question. You do prioritize content shared by verified users currently? We, we, we do have signals that do that. We are identifying those and asking ourselves whether that is still true and is still, still correct today. Um, and then I'm just going to end with my final minute to, to talk about industry standards. I think my colleague Diana Deget hit it on the issue, because this is across the technological space. You're not the only one that's trying to address these type of concerns. Many, uh, many industries have banded together to have uh, 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 industry standards by which they can comply and also can help self-police and self-correct. I would encourage the tech sector to start looking at at that motto, and there's a lot of them out there. I was fortunate to get this book, The Future Computed, in one of my visits to Tech World. And, um, you know, they just mentioned fairness, reliability, privacy, inclusion, transparency, and accountability as kind of base loads of standards that should go across the platform. And um, we need to get there for the use of the platforms and trust. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, thank you for being here today. And I'm pleased that Twitter has started taking steps to improve users' experience on its platform. However, Twitter's current policies still leave consumers in danger of spread of misinformation and harassment. 
Twitter needs to strengthen its policies to ensure that users are protected from fake accounts, misinformation, and harassment. And I know that's an issue y'all are trying to address. I'd like to start off by addressing privacy. Twitter has changed its policy in regards to the general data protection regulation uh, that went into effect by the European Union this summer. The GDPR makes it clear that consumers need to be in control of their own data and understand how their data is being given to others. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, as it now stands, as the United States does not mandate these settings are in force. However, uh, I think they are uh, important for an integral, integral part of consumers. My question is, will Twitter commit to allowing users in the United States have the option of opting out of tracking dis despite the fact that there's no current regulation mandating this for protection for consumers? Thank you for the question. We, we uh, even before GDPR, was enacted and we complied uh, with with that regulation. Uh, a year prior, we were actively making sure that our the, the people that we serve have the controls necessary to opt out of tracking across the web, to understand all the data that we have inferred on their usage, and to individually turn that off and on. So we took some major steps pre-GDPR and made sure that we complied with GDPR as well. We are very different from our peers in that the majority of what is on Twitter is public. People are approaching Twitter with a mindset of when I tweet this, the whole world can see it. So we have, uh, we have, we have a different approach um, and different needs, but we do believe that privacy is a fundamental human right, and we will work to protect it and continue to look for ways to uh, give people more control and more transparency around what we have on them. Thank you. One of the steps Twitter has taken to protect consumers has been to come together with other social media platforms to create the global inter internet forum to counter terrorism. However, there's no forum to counter fake bot, uh, bot accounts on social media platforms. Uh, what steps is Twitter taking to work together with social media platforms to combat these fake bots accounts like the 770 accounts Twitter and other social media platforms recently deleted that were linked to Russian and Iranian disinformation campaigns? Yeah, so this, this one is definitely a complicated issue that we're, we're addressing head on. Um, there's, a, there's a few things. We, we, we would love to just generally be able to identify bots across the platform, and we can do that by recognizing when uh, people come in through our API. There are other vectors of attack where people script our website or our app to make it look as if they were humans and they're not coming through our API. So it's not a simple answer, but having said that, we have gotten a lot better in terms of identifying and also challenging accounts. We identify eight to 10 million accounts every single week and challenge them to determine if they're human or not. And we've also thwarted over half a million accounts every single day from even logging into Twitter because of what we detected to be suspicious activity. So there's a lot more that we need to do, but I think we do have a good start. We always want to side with more automated technology that recognize behavior and patterns um, instead of um, going down to the surface area of uh, names or profile images or whatnot. So we're looking for behaviors and the intention of the action, uh, which is oftentimes to artificially amplify information and manipulate others. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm out of my time, and thank you for being here. Today. Mr. Green. Thank you so much. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, chairman of our health subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, for four minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. Um, I'll just say that, you know, Twitter is in addition to everything else, it's a news source. And it's how I learned of the death of Osama bin Laden many, many years ago when SEAL Team 6 provided that information. And it happened in real time, late a Sunday night. The news shows are all over, and Twitter provided the information. Uh, this morning, uh, sitting in conference, not able to get to a television, but one of my local television stations was attacked, and Twitter provided the real time information and updates. So it's extremely useful. And uh, uh, for that as a tool, I, I thank you. Sometimes, though, well, Meghan McCain's husband complained a lot on Twitter over the weekend because of a doctored image of Meghan McCain that was put up on Twitter, and then it seemed like it took forever for that to come down. 
is there not some way that people can, not, I understand their algorithms, I understand that you, you have to have checks and balances, but really it shouldn't take hours for something that's that egregious to be addressed. Absolutely, and that was unacceptable. And we don't want to use our scale as an excuse here. We, we do need to prioritize, we need to do two things. Number one, we can't place the burden on the victims. And that means we need to build technology so that we are not waiting for <coughs> reports. Um, there, we're actively looking for instances. While we do have reports and while we, do, while we are making um, those changes in building that technology, we need to do a better job at prioritizing um, especially any sort of violent or, or uh, threatening information. In this particular case, uh, this was an image, and we just didn't apply the image filter to recognize what was going on in real time. So uh, we did take way too many hours to act, um, and we, we are using that as a lesson to, in, in order to help improve our systems. And I'm sure you have, but just for the record, have you apologized to the McCain family? I haven't personally, but I will. I think you just did. Um, but along the same lines, but maybe a little bit different, I mean, the chairman referenced several members of Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, who had been affected by what was described as, as shadow banning. So <clears throat> does someone have to report? It, is, it, is it only fixed if someone complains about it? And if no one complained, would it have been fixed? So with Mr. Jordan, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Getz, and their accounts being diminished, is it only because they complained that that got fixed? It, it's a completely fair point. And you know, we, we are regularly looking at um, the outcomes of our algorithms. Um, we, it wasn't just the, the, the voices of members of Congress. We saw, as we rolled this system out, um, a general conversation about it, and some Sometimes we need to roll these out and see what happens because we're not going to be able to test every single outcome uh, in the right way. So we, we did get a lot of feedback and a lot of conversations about it and that is what prompted more digging and an understanding of, of what we were actually doing and whether it was the right approach. And as a committee, can we expect any sort of follow up as to your own internal investigation your own investigation, this digging that you described. Is that something that, that you can share with us as you get more information? We, we, would, we would love to. I mean, we, we want to put a premium on transparency and also how we can give you information um, that is uh, clearly accountable to changes. Um, that, that is why we're putting the majority of uh, our focus on this particular topic into our transparency report that we would love to We'd love to release. It is going to require a bunch of work sure. and some time to do that, but we, we would love to put, share it. And we appreciate your attention to that, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognized the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for uh, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dorsey, welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, I want to read a few quotes about Twitter's practices, and I just want you to tell me if they're true or not. Uh, social media is being rigged to censor conservatives. Is that true of Twitter? No. I don't know what Twitter is up to. It sure looks like to me that they're censoring people and they ought to stop it. Uh, are you censoring people? No. Twitter shadow banning prominent Republicans. Bad. Is that true? No. So these were statements made by Kevin McCarthy, the House Majority Leader on Twitter, Devin Nunes on Fox News, and President Trump on Twitter, and I want to place those statements into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. I think it's important for people to understand, you know, the premise of this whole hearing uh, and the reason that Twitter somehow, with all the other social media platforms out there, got the singular honor to sit in front of this committee uh, is because there's some implication that, that your site is, is trying to censor conservative voices on your platform. Now, when you tried to explain the shadow banning, as I understand it, uh, you had a, a system where if people who were following people had some behaviors, that, that was the trigger that, allowed, that, that caused you to do the shadow banning. So you were really like an equal opportunity shadow banner, right? You didn't just shadow ban for conservative Republicans. 
you shadow ban 600,000 people across your entire platform across the globe who had people following them that had certain behaviors that caused you to downgrade th them coming up. Is that correct? Correct. So this was never targeted at conservative Republicans. Uh, this was targeted to a group of 600,000 people because of the people who followed them. And then you determined that wasn't fair, and you corrected that practice. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. So just, just for the record, uh, since you've been singled out as a social media platform before this committee, uh, Twitter undertook no behavior to selectively censor conservative Republicans or conservative voices on your platform. Is that correct? Correct. Good. So let the record reflect that, because that's the whole reason, supposedly, we're here. Because House Leader Kevin McCarthy wrote our chairman a letter and said, hey, this is going on, and we think your committee should investigate it. And it's a load of crap. Now let me ask you a couple other things while I still have some time. Uh, what are you doing to address the real concerns many of us have about Twitter, people that use Twitter to bully, troll, or threaten other people? Uh, we know that this has led to many prominent users, particularly women, who have been targeted with sexual threats leaving Twitter because of this toxic environment. Now, I understand that you're working to address these issues and that you want to use machine learning and AI, but I'm concerned that these solutions will take too long to deploy and that they can't cure the ills that Twitter is currently suffering from. So my question is, how can we be assured that you and your company have the proper incentives to address the toxicity and abusive behavior on your platform given Twitter's current state? First and foremost, we, our singular objective as a company right now is to increase the health of public conversation. And we realize that that will come at short-term cost. We realize that we will be removing accounts we realize um, that it doesn't necessarily go into a formula where um, I think there's a perception that we're not going to act because we want as much uh, activity as possible. That right, is, there's like an economic disincentive to act because it takes people from your platform. Yeah, that right? is not true. So we, we see increasing health of public conversation as a growth vector for us. Good. It is not a short-term growth vector, it is a long-term growth vector, and we are willing to take the hard to take the hard path and the decisions in order to do so and we communicated a lot of these during our last earnings call and the reaction by Wall Street was not as positive but we believe it was important for us to continue to increase the health of this public square otherwise no one's going to use it in the first place thank you for being here today I yield back gentleman yields back uh, chair recognized gentleman from Texas former chairman of the committee mr. Barton for four minutes Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you, sir, for appearing voluntarily uh, without subpoena and standing or sitting there all by yourself. That's refreshing. Uh, I don't know what a Twitter CEO should look like, but you don't look like a CEO of Twitter should look like with that beard. My mom would agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to kind of reverse the, the questions that my good friend Mr. Doyle just asked. Um, so that we kind of get both sides of the question. In, the, in a July blog post, uh, your company Twitter indicated some Democrat politicians were not properly showing up within search auto suggestions. In other words, uh, your company said that, uh, that your algorithms were, were somewhat discriminatory against Democrats. Can you identify which Democrat representatives and accounts uh, weren't properly showing up? We, we typically don't identify those um, as a matter of protecting their privacy, and they haven't communicated that, um, but we can certainly follow up with your staff. All right. Can you identify how many? Uh, again, name we, and names. We will follow up with your staff on that. Can you personally vouch that that statement is a true statement? Yes. That there are Democrat politicians who, when you did the auto search, they didn't show up. Yes. It was six. It was over six hundred thousand accounts. No, no. There were six hundred thousand accounts affected. But how many Democrat versus Republican accounts? Yes. See, I, the I, allegation that we make, the Republicans, is that you're discriminatory 
against us, against the Republicans. Your post says, well, there were some Democrat politicians too. So out of 600,000, if there were 1,000 Republicans and 10 Democrats, it still seems somewhat biased. If it's 50-50, then that's a whole different ball game. Well, we, we agree that the result was not impartial, and that is why we, we corrected and we fixed it. So you do agree that there were more Republicans than Democrats? I didn't say that, but I, 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 do, I do agree. Well, you can't have it both ways, sir. <laughs> It's either 50-50 or one side is disproportionately affected, and the allegation is that, that more Republicans were affected. Well, we don't always have the best methods to determine who is a Republican and who is a Democrat. Uh, we have to- Well, usually or, it's known because we run as Republicans or Democrats. That's not hard to identify. Uh, yes, it, when, when it is self-identified, it is easier, um, but we, you know, we're happy to follow up with you. Well, do you want to, my chairman keeps whispering in my ear, I'm, I'm glad to have a staffer who's the chairman of the committee. Um, do you discriminate more on philosophy, like anti-conservative versus pro-liberal? No, our, our policies and our algorithms don't take into consideration any affiliation, philosophy, or viewpoint. That's hard to stomach. I'm not. I, I just, there wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this discussion if there wasn't a general agreement that, that your company has discriminated against conservatives, most of whom happen to be Republican. I, I, I believe that we have found impartial outcomes, and, and those are what we intend to fix and continue to measure. All right. Well, my time's about to expire. You said you would provide my staff uh, answers with some more specificity, and I hope you mean that. But again, thank you for voluntarily appearing. Thank you. I we'll follow up with you. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, for four minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dorsey, thank you for being here. I know it's uh, becoming a long day for you. Uh, I want to talk to you about anonymization. It's been noted that advertising is less concerned with identifying the individual, per se, than with the activity of users to predict and infer consumer behavior. But I wonder if that is quickly becoming a distinction without a difference. Even when user content isn't associated with that user's name, precise information can and is gathered through metadata associated with messages or tweets. For instance, Twitter offers geospatial metadata that requires parsing the tweet for location and names of interest, including nicknames. The metadata could then be associated with other publicly available social media data to re-identify individuals, and researchers have demonstrated this ability. So even though advertising itself may not be considered with identifying the individual, how is Twitter working to ensure its data is not being used by others to do so? Well, we, um, first and foremost, the, the data on Twitter is very different than our peer companies, uh, given that the majority of our data is public by default. And where we do infer information uh, around people's interests or their behaviors on the network, uh, we enable them first and foremost to see what we've collected, and second, turn it off. Um, and in terms of our, our data business, our, our data business is actually focused on uh, packaging up uh, and making real time the public data. And we send everyone who wants to consume that real time stream of the public data through a know your customer process, which we audit every year as well to make sure that the intent is still good and proper and also consistent with how they signed up. Um, as I previously announced in this committee, I'm soon introducing legislation to direct the Department of Commerce to convene a working group of stakeholders to develop a consensus-based definition of blockchain. Distributed ledger technologies such as blockchain have particularly interesting potential applications in the communication space, ranging from identity verification to IoT deployments and spectrum sharing. But there currently is no common definition of blockchain which could hinder its in its deployment. You have previously expressed interest in the broad applications of blockchain technology, including potentially in your effort 
to verify identity to fight misinformation and scams. What potential applications do you see for blockchain? I, you know, first and foremost, we need to start with the problems that we're trying to solve and the problems we're solving for our customers and then look at all available technology uh, in order to understand if it can help us or accelerate or make those outcomes much better. So blockchain is, is one that I think has a lot of untapped potential, um, specifically around um, distributed trust and distributed enforcement, potentially. Um, we haven't gone as deep uh, as we'd like just yet in understanding how we might apply this technology to the problems we're facing at Twitter, but we do have people within the company thinking about it today. Okay. Um, advertising supported models like Twitter generate revenue through user provided data. In ter your terms of service, you maintain that what's yours is yours, you own your content. I appreciate that, but I understand more about that. To me, it means users ought to have some say about if, how, and when it's used. But you say that Twitter has an evolving set of rules for how partners can interact with user content and that Twitter may modify or adapt this content as it's distributed. The hearings this committee has held demonstrated that the real crux of the issue is how content is used and modified to develop assumptions and inferences about users to better target ads to the individual. Do you believe that consumers own their data even when that data has modified, used to develop inferences, supplemented by additional data or otherwise? So, sorry, what, what was the question? Do I believe? I, do you believe that consumers own their data? Yes. Even when that data has modified, used to develop inferences, supplemented by additional data or otherwise? Yes, generally, um, we would want to understand all the uh, ramifications of that, but yes, we believe that people own their data and should have ultimate control over it. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Emily yields back. Chair now recognizes the uh, whip of the house, Mr. Scalise, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Dorsey, appreciate you coming, and as uh, others have said, we, uh, we are welcoming your testimony and your willingness to answer some of these questions. And I think there are serious concerns more than anything about how Twitter has been used and will continue to be used, and, and clearly there's many examples of uh, things that Twitter has done, and you, you can just look at the Arab Spring, many people would suggest uh, that a lot of the, uh, the real ability for the Arab Spring to take off started with platforms like Twitter. And in, in 2009, you were banned in Iran, and uh, we've seen other countries, China, North Korea, have banned Twitter. Um, and I would imagine when Twitter was banned, it wasn't a good feeling. Uh, but what we're concerned about is how Twitter has, in some ways, looks like selectively uh, adversely affected conservatives. I, I want to go through a couple of examples. And I would imagine you're familiar with these, but our colleague, Marsha Blackburn, when she announced her campaign for the Senate, Twitter quickly banned her announcement advertisement because it had a pro-life message. Uh, she, at the time, was the chair of the special select committee that a number of my colleagues, both Republican and Democrat, here were on that were looking into the sale of body parts. And Twitter banned her because they said, the statement was deemed an inflammatory statement that is likely to evoke a strong negative reaction. Are you familiar with this? Yes. Why, why was she banned for just stating a fact that Congress was actually investigating because of the deep concern nationally uh, when the scandal took place? Well, first, we, this was a mistake, and we do apologize. This was a mistake by Twitter. It was a mistake by Twitter. It was a mistake by us, which we corrected. So was anybody held accountable for that mistake? What do you mean by that? Well, somebody, I mean, there was a spokesperson here that said, we deem it inflammatory. Twitter deems it inflammatory. And at the same time, the, the organization that was selling the body parts was not banned by Twitter, but our colleague who just exposed the fact that the, sell, the sale of body parts was going on was banned by Twitter. And your, one of your own spokespersons said that it was inflammatory. Was that person held accountable for making those kind of statements? We use the, you know, these, these events and these uh, opportunities to improve our process. 
um, and look and for we've ways. talked about that and, and obviously I appreciate the fact that you've acknowledged that there have been some mistakes made in algorithms and we've talked about this with other companies faith Facebook was in here talking about similar concerns that we had with their algorithm and and how we felt it might have biased against conservatives um, a liberal website vice did a study of all members of Congress all 535 and they identified only three that they felt were targeted in the shadow banning and that was uh, reps Meadows Jordan and Gates and and I know while I think Mr. Barton was trying to get into this in more detail uh, if there were 600,000 uh, ultimately they did a study and found only three members of Congress were biased against and all three happened to be conservatives and so uh, can you at least see that that is a concern that a lot of us have uh, if there is a real bias in the algorithm as it was developed and look I've written algorithms before so if somebody wrote an algorithm with a bias against conservatives I would hope you are trying to find out who those people are and if they're using their own personal view viewpoints to discriminate against certain people because if it's your stated intention that you don't want that discrimination to take place I would hope that you would want to know if there are people working for Twitter that did have that kind of discriminatory viewpoint against conservatives that you would at least hold them accountable so that it doesn't happen again I would want to know that and I assure you that the algorithm was not written with that intention the signal that we were using caught people up in it and it was a signal that we determined was not relevant and also not fair in this particular case and there will be times and this is where we need to experiment as as you know in writing algorithms in the past that you need to test things and see if they work at scale and pull them back correctly if they don't and yeah, that but, is, but also you should inject intention. your own personal viewpoint into that unless that's, that's the intention of the company but you're saying it's not that is not the intention, the intention of the and they should never be and I know I'm out of time but I appreciate at least your answer in these questions hopefully we can get some more answers to these examples and there are others like this that uh, we'd surely like to have addressed thank you thank Goodbye. you chair now look recognizes the order we'll have order in the hearing room or you'll be asked to leave you'll ma'am if you'll please take a seat or we'll have to have you then you'll need to relieve Trump help us Please help us, Mr. President, before it is too late, because Jack Dorsey is trying to influence the election, huh? to sway the election. What's she so saying? I can't understand her. What? The election. That is why What's she? I don't have it at end. Twelve at half fifteen. Seven at end. Twenty dollar two at half five. Seven at half thirty. Hit thirty dollar down here. Two at half five. Thirty five. Seven at half forty. Hit forty dollar two at half five. Five forty five. Seven at half fifty. Hit fifty dollar down here. Two at half five. Officer, will you escort this young lady out, please? Hit two at half now. Five sixty five. Seven at half seventy. What two and a half now? Five seventy five. Seven and a half. Eighty dollar to five. Eighty five ninety. Eight hundred dollar at ten. Ten ten. A quarter. One a quarter. One half seventy five. Two two. Two and a quarter. Hit two and a half seventy five. Three able to bomb. Three hundred. Hit three and a quarter. Cut three and a quarter now, half, half, three and a half. Set of five, four hundred. Yeah, but a four. Four and a quarter, four and a half. We're selling the cell phone there. Four and a quarter, four and a half. Hit four and a half, four seventy five. Five hundred, five, five and a quarter, five and a half. I yield back. <laughs> Somehow I think our auctioneer and resident's going to get tweeted about today. Yeah. I would remind members of the audience, you're here to observe, not participate, and I appreciate that. We'll now turn to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for four minutes. That's a hard act to follow, Mr. Chairman. That's a, a hard act to follow. Maybe I'll get Mr. Long to uh, help me along a little bit as well. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Pallone, uh, Mr. Dorsey, welcome. Our country is facing a direct threat to our democratic institutions. Uh, we need to find ways to stop foreign adversaries like Russia and Iran from using American technology against us. Earlier this year, Special Counsel Robert Mueller filed an indictment against the Russian Internet Research Agency, charging that they created fake social media accounts, sometimes using American stolen identities to sow discord and interfere with our 2016 elections. I have a copy of that indictment here, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce it for the record. Uh, without objection. Um, Mr. Dorsey, uh, Twitter uh, recently took down a number of Russian and Iranian-linked accounts 
after it was tipped off by a cybersecurity firm. I'm glad to see that Twitter is taking action to protect us, but do you think we should be concerned that an outside cybersecurity firm detected fraudulent activity before you did? Well, I think it's really important that we have outsiders um, and we have an open channel to them because they're always going to approach the data and the work uh, in a way that we may not see. And um, we're going to do our best to capture everything that we can and to be as proactive as we can. But we want to leave room for others to bring a different perspective that might uh, look at what's happening on the platform in a different way that we do. So how confident are you that Twitter can identify and remove uh, all of the fake and automated accounts uh, linked to a foreign adversary on your platform? We're getting more and more confident. I, I, I do want to state that this is not something that has an endpoint uh, that reaches perfection. We're always going to have to stay 10 steps ahead of the newest ways of attack, attacking and, and newer vectors. Um, and we are getting more agile and better at identifying those. And that's showing in some of our results, um, which I talked about earlier in, in, the, in the terms of being able to identify eight to 10 million uh, suspicious accounts every single week, and then also challenging them uh, to see if they're humans or bots or some sort of malicious automation. I uh, understand that Twitter is now requiring some suspicious accounts to respond to recapture to prove that they're human accounts and not bots. Uh, I was surprised to, to learn that you're not requiring users to do the same thing when they first sign up for Twitter. New accounts are authenticated using only an email address. Could you tell me why that is? Uh, we, we actually do send accounts through a variety of authentication, including some con sometimes recapture. Um, it really depends on the context and the information that we have. We, we have thwarted uh, over a half a million accounts from even logging in in the first place because of that. Um, I understand that dealing with foreign advers adversaries can be difficult. Twitter may respond to one practice only to find new tactics being used to sow discord. Can you commit to us with any level of certainty that the 2018 midterm elections in the United States will not be subject to interference by foreign adversaries using bots or other fake accounts on your platform? We are committing to making our number one priority to help protect the integrity of the 2018 midterms and especially the conversation around it. And let me ask you this finally, are you aware of foreign adversaries using any different tactics on your platform to interfere in our 2018 midterm elections? None that we haven't uh, communicated to the Senate Intelligence Committee, and any that we do find, we will be communicating and sharing with them. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Dorsey, thanks very much for being here with us today. I'd like to, uh, ask uh, my first question on uh, how you're protecting that uh, uh, user's data. Do you collect any data from other third parties about Twitter users? Uh, we, we don't collect data from third parties about um, Twitter folks. We do uh, have embeds of tweets around the web, and when people do uh, go visit those sites, we note that, and um, we can integrate it when they do log into Twitter, but people can turn that off as well. Let me just admit, let's, uh, now how, how does Twitter use that data? Uh, we use the data to personalize um, the experience specifically around, uh, it might, incur, it might uh, infer a particular interest so that we can show them s uh, specific topics or make our advertising targeting better. Okay. Is that sold or offered in some other form then to the advertisers? I'm, I'm Is sorry? it sold to the advertisers? Is it sold to the advertiser? No. Let me, uh, let me uh, back up to where uh, Mr. Shimkus was when we were talking about the verification of the blue check mark. How is it easy is it for someone to obtain a verified Twitter handle, and what does uh, Twitter take to ensure it is not highlighting one political viewpoint over another through the use of that verification on the platform? Well, right now it's extremely challenging because we've paused the verification program um, because we found so many faults in it that we, we, we knew we needed a restart. Um, we do make exceptions uh, for any representatives of government, um, particular brands or public figures of, of interest. Um, but we generally have paused that work. Uh, before that pause, we did uh, allow anyone to submit 
uh, an application to be verified, and it, uses very, it used various criteria in order to determine if the verification was, uh, was necessary. Yeah, with that uh, verification, can, for that uh, has said that you all have said that uh, can be removed for the activity on the on-off platform. What off-platform is the basis for someone losing that blue verified check mark? Uh, we we look at uh, specifically any violent extremist groups and off plat off platform behavior for violent extremist groups when we consider not just verification um, but also um, holding an account in the first place. Okay. In your statement, uh, you said in the last year, Twitter developed and launched more than 30 policy and product changes designed to foster information integrity and protect the people who use our service from abuse and malicious uh, automation. Can you share with the committee uh, what those 30 plus policy and product changes are or, or highlight some and then give us the yeah. others in written? And we, we, can, we can certainly follow up with all of you on exactly the details, but um, we, uh, we established new models, uh, for instance, to detect where people are gaming our systems. These are algorithms uh, with an intent to artificially amplify. Uh, we have new reporting flows um, that enable people um, to report tweets or accounts. Um, we have changed policies uh, reflective of current circumstances and what we're seeing. Um, and we have certainly done a bunch of work uh, around GDPR, which has affected our work in general, um, but we will follow up with you with an uh, enumeration. If we can get those uh, 30 points of you, uh, great, and submit those to the committee. You also indicated in your written uh, statement that the company conducted an internal analysis of members of Congress affected by the auto suggest search issue, and that you make that information available to committee if requested. Will you commit to us on the committee that you will present all Twitter's analysis as soon as that uh, is possible after this hearing? Yes, and we also hope to include this in our long-standing uh, initiative of a transparency report around our actions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired. Thank the gentleman from Ohio. Chair recognizes the lady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Mr. Dorsey, do you feel like you're uh, being manipulated yourself? You're part of a manipulation campaign because, I mean, when you see that the majority leader of the Congress is running ads on Facebook, to fundraise around allegations of anti-conservative bias on social media platforms. And then you see the Trump campaign use President Trump's tweets where he claims anti-conservative bias at Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And then you, we saw this outburst today. The woman jumped up, of course, with her phone so that she can get that, and that's probably trying to spread on the web. And now the Justice Department even says, boy, we, this is so serious, we have to investigate it. Does this feel like a a manipulation campaign itself to you? Well, look, as I, as I noted in my opening, I, I do believe that there's growing concern around um, the power that companies like ours hold. And specific, the, the reason why is people do see us as a digital public square, and that comes with certain expectations. And That's we, a very diplomatic answer, <laughs> I have to say, because there are very serious questions. I mean, the uh, Russian trolls created thousands of bots to influence our democracy, our elections. They're doing it in other countries across the world. Um, do, you, do you feel like you have a handle on these bots? You said earlier in your testimony, you ID eight to 10 million accounts per month. Is that right? Uh, per week. Per week. Um, and to thwart over a half a million accounts from logging in every single day. Can Twitter keep up? We're, we intend to keep up. I mean, I mean, if, so they, if they're using automated accounts, isn't don't we reach a point where they're, they're, they have the ability to overwhelm content on Twitter and affect your algorithms? Maybe, I, I, I mean, it is definitely, others have described this as an arms race, but I, I believe it's very much like security. Um, there's no perfect endpoint. When you build a lock, someone else will figure out how to break it, and therefore you can't try to design and optimize for the perfect lock, you always you, have to build a secret Can't you identify the bots at least uh, as they sign up uh, some we, way so that folks understand, okay, that's an, a fake automated account? In certain cases we can, and it's a great point, um, especially through our API. There are more sophisticated ways of automation um, that actually script our site and our app um, that are much harder to detect. 
because they're intending to look like human behavior with the slowness of human behavior rather than the speed of through an API. So it's a little bit more complicated. It's not a challenge we're uh, not intending to face. We're taking it head on. You have some creative minds. I would think you can put all of those uh, creative minds, all of your expertise to work to, to do that. I want to ask you a little bit about privacy. Twitter and other companies collect information on users and non-users, oftentimes without their knowledge. Uh, Twitter's business model is based on advertising, and you serve targeted advertising to users based on vast amounts of data that you collect, uh, which raises uh, consumer privacy concerns. You, you know, up until last year, you, uh, the privacy policy included a promise uh, to support do not track, but then you changed your mind. Uh, why? Why shouldn't it be up to consumers? Why shouldn't it be the consumer's choice on tracking? Well, we do, we do allow consumers within the app to turn off tracking across the web. But you, you, they cannot, you're, you're still able to build the, um, a profile on each and every user, isn't that correct? Uh, if, if they log into the account, uh, then yes, and we allow them to turn that off. Isn't it, but I understand that even when they go and they change, they, they opt out, but you're still collecting data on them. You're still tracking them. I don't believe that's the case, but happy to follow up with you with our team. Okay, let's do that, because I'm out of time. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the Republican Conference, gentle lady from Washington State, Kathy Morris Rogers, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for joining us today. I want to start off by saying that I think Twitter is a valuable tool in modern communication, and it's why back in 2011 I was spearheading an effort to get our members signed up and using this tool. I think it's a great way to interact with the people that we represent, and since then it's been uh, amazing to see the growth of Twitter and the Twitter users all across America and the world. It's why I think this hearing is so timely. There's a lot of serious questions that Americans have regarding tech platforms and the ones that they're using every day and the issues like data privacy, community standards, and censorship. Today, I want to focus on Twitter's procedures for taking down offensive and inappropriate content. And as you know, there's been examples that were already shared today. I was going to highlight the one with Meghan McCain with the altered image of a gun pointed at her uh, when she was mourning her father's loss. And the, the tweet image said, America, this one's for you. Obviously, this offensive tweet was reported by other users, even to you, I understand. Yet it took nearly 16 hours for there to be action to take it down. So I just wanted to ask, first, do you think that this is a violation of Twitter's content policies and rules against violence and physical harm? And then I'd also like to understand how much of this is driven by the algorithm versus human content man managers. So it, it, it definitely is a violation. Uh, and we were slow to act. Um, the, the tweet was, was actually up for five hours, um, but f five hours way too long. And um, we build, we, our current model works in terms of removing content based on reports that we receive. And we don't believe that that is fair, ultimately. We don't believe that we should put the burden of reporting abuse or harassment on the victim of it. We need to build algorithms to proactively look for when these things are occurring and take action. So the number of abuse reports that we get is a number that we would like to see go down, not only because there's less abuse on the platform, but because our algorithms are recognizing these things before someone has to report them. And, and that is our goal, and it will take some time. And meanwhile, can you well, talk we, to me then just about what are your current policies? What are the current policies for prioritizing timely takedowns and enforcement? Yeah, so uh, any sort of um, violent threat or image uh, is at the top of our priority list in order to review and enforce. And uh, we do have a prioritization mechanism for tweets as we get the, the reports, but obviously this one was too slow and it, it was not as precise as it needs to be. In this particular case, the reason wh why was because it, it was captured within an image rather than the tweet text itself. So I think much of the concern surrounding this incident and some others has been how long it takes to remove the content when there's a clear violation. 
and the issue only seemed to be resolved after people publicly tweeted about it, providing a larger platform for this type of content than it ever should have had. So I did want to hear what steps the company is going to be taking to speed up its response time to future ones to ensure these kind of incidences don't continue. In the short term, we need to do a better job at prioritizing um, around the reports we receive. And this is independent of what people see or, or report to us on the platform. And in the longer term, we need to take the burden away from the victim from having to report in the first place. Okay, well, clearly you hold a large amount of power in the public discourse. And allowing speech that incites violence could have devastating consequences. And this is one way where I believe it's very important that Twitter take action to help restore trust uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the people and your platform. So, and with that, I'll yield back my time. Chairman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, thank you for coming. Um, there are a number of important topics that we could be discussing with you today, but unfortunately the Republican majority has decided to pursue the trumped-up notion that there is a special conservative bias at work in the way Twitter operates, and that's a shame. What worries me is that this is all part of a campaign by the GOP and the right wing to work the refs, complaining of non-existent bias to force an overcorrection, which then can result in some actual bias going in the other direction. And we saw this actually with Facebook. Conservatives cried bias because Facebook was seeking to make information available using reputable news sources instead of far right-wing outlets or conspiracy platforms. So Facebook got pushed into this correction and it got rid of its human editors and the result was Immediately, it was overrun with hoaxes that were posing as news. I actually have questions about the subject of the hearing, but I'm going to submit those for um, the record and ask for written responses, because I don't really have confidence that this hearing was convened for a serious purpose, um, to be candid. Like I said, I think it's just a chance to work the ref to push platforms like yours away from the serious task of empowering people with good and reliable information. But what is really frustrating to me about today's inquiry is that my Republican colleagues know there are plenty of other kinds of investigations that we should be undertaking in this Congress, but they don't have any interest in pursuing them. And that's not just conjecture. There's actually a list that's been circulating um, that Republicans put together of all the investigations that they've been blocking, sweeping under the rug because they want to hide the truth from the American people. And this spreadsheet, which is going around, is pretty telling. It's circulating in Republican uh, circles. So what are these things that they know could and should be investigated, but they are determined to dismiss or bury or ignore altogether? According to their own secret cover-up list, Republicans don't want the public to see President Trump's tax returns. They don't want the public to know about Trump's business dealings with Russia. They're determined not to investigate Secretary of Treasury Steven Mnuchin's business dealings. They're blocking public inquiry into the personal email use of White House staff. They're willfully ignoring how taxpayer money has been wasted by corrupt cabinet secretaries for first class travel, private jets, large security details, office expenses, and other misused perks. They're giving the president a pass on investigation into the motives behind his travel ban and his family separation policy. They definitely don't want the public to see how poorly the Trump White House responded to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And finally, they don't want the public to see how the administration is failing to protect our elections and guard against hacking attempts. These are all things that deserve attention and inquiry of this Congress, but the Republicans are not going to let it happen. Let me just go back in the last 40 seconds and talk about election security because we're 60 days away from the midterm election. We know there are only efforts to disrupt our democracy. We know these same actors, these foreign and hostile actors, are using this very platform, Twitter and others, to sow discord. We know the public is desperate that their representatives, that's us, will act to protect their democracy. And we know, thanks to this list, that the Republicans know they should be investigating our nation's election security and hacking attempts by hostile actors. Instead, 
Here we are using our precious resources to feed deep state conspiracy theories proffered by the president and his allies in Congress. It's a shame that this committee, frankly, has been drawn into such a charade. I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi, Chair of the Oversight Subcommittee, Mr. Harper, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for uh, taking this time to be here. It's a very important topic. Uh, we all utilize uh, Twitter. Uh, you have a very um, daunting task to try to work through this. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot. And we've talked a lot today about algorithms. Uh, and of course, those are really only as good as the people who create them, edit them, and guide them. And uh, algorithms uh, have to be trained, which means, as you know, the feeding them a lot of data. My understanding is that oversight of machine learning algorithms involves examining the data sets or the search results to look for that bias. If bias is spotted, then the algorithm can be adjusted and we should, retrained. Uh, so I want to understand the oversight that Twitter does of its own algorithms. The algorithms that support Twitter's algorithmic timeline are adjusted, if not daily, almost daily. Uh, why is that? And what are some reasons why the algorithms would need to be adjusted daily? So we, um, we you know, bias in algorithms is, is, a, is a rather new um, field of research within broader artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's something that is certainly new to us as a company as well. We do have teams who are focused on um, creating roadmaps so that we can fully understand best practices for uh, training data sets and also measuring impartiality of outcomes. But I will say that we're pretty early in that work. Uh, we intend to get better much faster, but we are very, very early. Uh, we're learning as quickly as possible, as is the industry, on how best to do this work and also how best to measure whether we're doing the right thing or not. Um, in terms of why we need to um, uh, change the signals uh, all the time is because we, when we release some of these models, um, we release them in smaller tests and then as they go out to the broader Twitter at scale, we discover some unexpected things. And those unexpected things will lead to questions which then cause us to look deeper at the particular signals that we're using. And uh, as we recognize that there are any sort of impartiality within the outcome, we work to fix. And it is somewhat dependent upon people giving us feedback. And those, um, those teams that you're talking about, those are individuals, correct? They're, they're people in the, that, are, that are employees of uh, Twitter. Yes, yes. And, and how do you take into account uh, what their leanings or their you know, bias or life story, does that have an input into what they determine is important or what to look for? Or how do you factor that in? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have an input that, that we use. Uh, the way we judge ourselves ultimately is, are the algorithms making objective decisions? Are engineers using engineering rigor, uh, which is free of um, bias and free of any uh, action that might uh, be aligned with one one particular perspective or, or not. Or not. Okay. So, if I can ask this, because you only have a few moments, what are they looking for? What, uh, what do they look for when they're deciding whether or not to make a change? Uh, they're, they're looking for fairness. They're looking for impartiality. They're looking okay. for right. Well, if, if I can, can interrupt just for a moment, who defines fairness? What is that fairness that's determined there? Uh, and because your fairness may be different than my definition of fairness, depending on what the issue or the interpretation of it is. Yeah, the, this goes back to um, those health indicators that we're trying to search for. So are we showing, for instance, a variety of perspective, or are we creating more echo chambers and filter bubbles? And, um, and, and as you've looked at these 600,000 users, uh, and then specifically you were asked earlier about that you, you said you would follow up on the number of Democrats or Republicans where, where are we to determine that? So my question is, you know, it's a pretty limited, uh, you know, pool. We're talking about 435 members of the House. Do you, do you have that info and just don't want to discuss it, or do you have to find that info on how many House members there were that were affected? We, we do have the info, and we will share it. Can you share it now? Yeah, we'll, we'll share it with you. Can you share it now in your testimony? I don't, ha I don't have it in front of me. Okay, but, All right, but we'll you will provide it. Gentlemen's time. Thank you. With that, I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time's expired. expired.
The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for four minutes. Okay, thank the chairman. Um, and I thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for the frankness you've been showing on answering our questions. But this hearing is really a desperate effort to rally the Republican base before the November election and to please President Trump. However, there are some real serious issues that we should be examining. For example, uh, targeting. Some social media networks have been accused of facilitating discriminatory advertising, such as housing and unemployment ads. So when targeting ads, are advertisers able to exclude certain categories of users on Twitter, which would be discriminatory? I'm sorry, can you, can you read for political ads or issue ads? Uh, no, for non-political ads. Are advertisers able to exclude groups or, or categories of users? Uh, advertisers are able to build criteria that in, include and exclude folks. So that could be, uh, end up being discriminatory? Uh, perhaps, yes. Um, uh, apart from reviewing how ads are targeted, does Twitter review how its ads are ultimately delivered and if any discriminatory effects occur as a result of its own op optimization process? Yes, we, we do do regular audits of uh, how our ads are targeted and how they're delivered and, and work to make sure that we, we have fairness within them. Sure, could you be briefly describe the process that Twitter uses uh, for making changes to algorithms? Uh, in, in terms of making changes to um, ads algorithms, um, we're looking first and foremost at um, the, the data test sets, uh, we run through tests to make sure that we are, um, that they're performing in the way that we expect with those outcomes, and then we bring them out uh, to production, uh, which is at scale uh, on the live system, and then also are doing checks to make sure that they are consistent with the constraints and boundaries that we expect. Has Twitter ever taken down an ad because of potential discriminatory effects, non-political? I'll, I'll have to follow up with you on that to get that information. Well, uh, it's difficult to know if Twitter's platforms are having discriminatory effects because there's no real way for watchdog groups to examine what's happening for potential biases. Twitter announced now that it's making political ads searchable. How about non-political ads? Is there a, a way for watchdog groups to examine how non-political ads are being targeted? Yeah, our Ads Transparency Center is um, comprehensive of all ads. Well, thank you. Okay, moving on to privacy. Uh, Twitter's privacy policy states that we believe you should always know where your data, uh, w what data we collect from you, and how we use it, and what you should, and you should have meaning contr control over both. But most Americans really don't know what's happening with their data. There's a saying that if you aren't paying for a product, that you are the product. Do you agree with that? Um. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, there, I do believe that we need to make more clear the exchange, what people are trading uh, to get a free service. I don't think we've done a great job at that, certainly within the service. Um, and I do believe that that is important work and we should clarify it more. Or, or is Twitter running educational campaigns to inform users about how data is being used? Not at the moment, but we should be looking at that and also the incentives that we're providing people on the platform. Okay. Um, I'm gonna follow up on some prior questions here. Uh, if, if users disable the track um, mechanism, then does Twitter previously, does Twitter still so, store previously collected data or does it erase it when they ask to be excluded, when they opt out? I, I believe it's a race, but we'll have to follow up with uh, the details. Okay, and so you'll commit to, can you commit to erasing data when people opt out? Uh, yes, well, let me just make sure I understand and we understand the constraints and the ramifications of that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, we will now take a five minute recess and reconvene in five minutes.
Our guests will take their seats. If our guests will take their seats and our members, we will resume the hearing now. And I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance, for four minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, I have uh, three areas of questioning. Uh, number one, in the Meghan McCain matter, in your opinion, would the photo have been taken down if those close to the victim, including her husband, had not complained to Twitter? If it would it have been taken down if they had not complained? Correct. Uh, we, we would have taken it down because we imagine we would have received other reports. Our system does work today based on reports for takedown. Uh, let me say that I think it's the unanimous view of this committee that uh, five hours is intolerable and um, it was horribly violent and uh, we are all opposed uh, to this type of violence on Twitter. Uh, regardless of when it occurs, and uh, certainly we hope that you do better in the future. Uh, number two, you state in your testimony on page six, bias can happen inadvertently due to many factors, such as the quality of the data used to train our models. In addition to ensuring that we are not deliberately biasing the algorithms, it is our responsibility to understand, measure, and reduce these accidental bias. The machine learning teams at Twitter are learning about these techniques and developing a roadmap to ensure our present and future machine learning models uphold a high standard when it comes to algorithmic fairness. Can you give the committee a time frame as to when we might expect that that would uh, receive uh, results that are fair to the American people, conservatives and, and perhaps liberals as well? Uh, I, I can't predict a, a very precise time frame at the moment. Um, this is something that is a high priority for us in terms of as we roll out algorithms, understanding that they are fair and that we are driving impartial outcomes. But it's hard to predict a particular time frame because this is not just a Twitter um, issue. This is the entire industry and a field of research within artificial intelligence. Um, I, I was asked on air in New York over the weekend whether uh, this will require regulation by the federal government. After all, we are a committee of jurisdiction in this regard. I certainly hope not, but I'm sure you can understand, Mr. Dorsey, that uh, we would like uh, this to uh, occur as quickly as possible because of the uh, great concern of the American people that there not be bias, intentional or unintentional. I, I do believe you're asking the important questions, especially as we move more of our decisions, not just as a company, but also as individuals, to artificial intelligence. And we need to understand, as we use um, this artificial intelligence for more and more of the things that we do, that number one, uh, that they're unbiased outcomes, and number two, that they can explain why they made the decision in the first place. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. And then my third area of questioning, prior to 2016, did Twitter have any policies in place to the address the use of the Twitter platform by foreign governments or entities for the purpose of influence, influencing a, an election in the United States. I am certainly as concerned as any member of this committee, regardless of political party, about what happened regarding Russia in 2016. And so prior to 2016, did you have any policies in place? We, we can follow up with you. I don't have that data right now in terms of what policies against foreign actors that we had before 2016. Um, but we did learn a lot within the 2016 elections that impacted both our technology and also the policies going forward. Oh, let me state that uh, I do not believe this is a partisan matter. This is a bipartisan matter. It is intolerable that there was any interference, and of course, we hope that it never occurs again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, for four minutes. For uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. There's really two uh, hearings going on. One uh, is about that man in the White House who has been accusing uh, as you have been sitting here, uh, the social media uh, giants of interfering in the election and uh, making this claim even as you were testifying. Uh, and in fact, recently said that the media giants were all in favor of Hillary Clinton in the election. I'll just give you a chance uh, to ask 
whether the company Twitter uh, had, a, had a policy of it, the company for either candidate in the presidential election? No, we did not. A absolutely not, I expect, right? The second uh, is a job that we're not doing. I mean, we're having Mr. Dorsey here, and it's a good opportunity given uh, his experience and his company. But these social media platforms are being abused in some cases. And there's efforts that are being made at Twitter. We had Mr. Zuckerberg here uh, some time ago, uh, efforts being made at Facebook uh, to deal with false accounts, to deal with hate speech, which you're trying to deal with, to deal with flat out false information, which is not the kind of thing you want on the digital town square, right? But the fundamental question that this committee refuses to ask itself is whether there's a role for publicly elected officials to make some of these decisions about how you protect people from hate speech, how you protect people from flat out false information. Now, you mentioned, Mr. Dorsey, that your company is investigating this. You've got your team working on it. And that's a good thing. But bottom line, do you believe that this should be something that's decided company by company? Or should we have rules of the road in a process that is monitored by elected officials in a regulatory agency? That's the question we're coming to. As uh, Mr. Harper earlier, I thought asked a very good question. What you determined to be fair or I determined to be fair, we may disagree. So who's gonna be the decider of that? Do you believe that ultimately it should be a decision on these important questions of privacy, on these important questions of hate speech, on these important matters you're trying to contend with about the abuse of your platform, should be decided on a company by company basis or should that be a public discussion and a public decision made by elected representatives? First, we want to make it a public discussion. We, this health and increasing health in the public space is not something we want to compete on. We don't want to have um, the only healthy public square. We want to contribute to all right. healthy public conversation. Independent of what the government believes it should do, we are going to continue to make this our singular objective because right. we believe it's right. And we're going to continue to share our approach and our work so that others can learn from it. And we're going to learn from others. So I, I do believe that we have uh, worked a lot more closely with our peers in order to solve some of these common issues that we're seeing and we'll come up with common solutions as long as we all have a mindset of this is not an area for us to compete. It's not an area to compete, but it's also ultimately as responsible as you and other companies want to be, which I, I grant you, you do. Ultimately, there will be a debate between the president, his, his vision of what is fair, and perhaps my vision of what is fair. And in the past, what we've had, we've, we now have the FCC, the FTC, they basically were designed to address problems when we use dial-up telephones. And this committee has not done anything to address the jurisdictional issues and public policy questions. And I do not believe that we should just be leaving it to the responsibility of private companies. But I appreciate the efforts that private Gentlemen, companies sir. are making. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Dorsey. Thank Gentlemen, you. Chair now recognized the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for four minutes. I thank the Chair and welcome Mr. Dorsey. You mentioned the opening statement, a group called the Trust and Safety Council within Twitter. On Twitter's blog, it relies on the Trust and Safety Council for guidance in evaluating and developing its own community guidelines. To use your words, your opening statement, to create that public square for a free exchange of ideas. And you've been pretty honest about your personal biases and the biases of people within Twitter. How pervasive are the biases on the Trust and Safety Council? Well, just for some context, our, our Trust and Safety Council is a external organization of um, about 40 uh, organizations that are global um, and are focused on particular issues such as online harassment or bullying um, or uh, misinformation. 
Um, so these are uh, entities that help us uh, give feedback on our policies and also our solutions that we're coming up with, but we take no direction from. Are these entities either Republican, Democrat, Tea Party, Green Party, any identity with their affiliation politically that comes into in Twitter's world? We, we do have some conservative-leaning organizations, but uh, we don't we don't add to the council based on ideology. It's on the issues. And I'm sure this council and Twitter does not uh, operate in this Twitter vote of secrecy, a vacuum. What other groups outside of this group help Twitter and influence your developing and shaping your community guidelines? Anybody else out there beside this trust and safety council you rely upon? Well, the, the, the trust and safety council is advisory. It, it makes no decisions for us. Um, most of our decisions are made internally, uh, and we, uh, we, we definitely take input from external folks, and we look at what's happening in uh, more of the secular trends of what's going on, but we don't take direction from anything external. Can we list those members of that council, the Trust Advisory Council, the those they, 40 entities that are your members? Safety Council, sorry, Trust and Safety Council. They are listed on our webpage, so okay. we have an accurate list of, of those. I apologize, I'll look that up. I also want to turn to back home, and uh, as you probably heard a little more than a year ago, Southeast Texas was fighting four feet of water from floods from Hurricane Harvey. A recent report from my alma mater, Rice University, highlights how platforms like Twitter play an important role in natural disasters and recovery. The report showed the increased use of mobile devices combined with social media platforms have empowered everyday citizens to report dangerous situations, life-saving operations. They can see people in trouble and report that very quickly. How does Twitter prioritize emergency services information during disasters? Like, for example, if Harvey comes up and hits us, another Harvey within a month or so. It's hurricane season. We, we, we do prioritize um, community outreach and emergency services on the platform. We, we actually do have some, some really good uh, evidence of this, uh, specifically with, uh, with Harvey. So we saw about 27 million tweets regarding Hurricane Harvey. Um, in Texas, 911 systems failed, and people did use Twitter to issue SOS calls. And uh, we saw as many as 10,000 10, people rescued from this. So this is something that we do prioritize and want to make sure that we are working with local uh, agencies uh, to make sure that we have a lot of strength here. Thank you. And close by recognizing that as a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals and a high-tech leader, I'll forgive you if your Cardinals hack into my Astros accounts. They hacked into my Astros accounts. We won the World Series. Thank you, St. Louis Cardinals. I yield back. Thank you. Go Cards. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico for four minutes. Mr. Luan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, thank you for being here today as well. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, yes or no, is it correct that President Trump lost followers because your platform decided to eliminate bots and fake accounts? Yes. During the initial purge of bots, who lost more followers, President Trump or former President Obama? I'm, I'm not sure of those details, but that was a broad-based action across all of Twitter. Subject to confirmation, do these numbers sound familiar? President Obama lost 2.3 million followers. President Trump lost roughly 320,000 followers. Uh, I, I would need to confirm that. That's what's been reported. So Mr. Dorsey, based on that, is it correct that Twitter's engaged in a conspiracy against former President Barack Obama? I, I don't believe we have any conspiracies against former president. I don't either. I don't think you have them against this president. Um, I, I want to commend you on your work with what was done associated with the evaluation following the 2016 election, which led to some of this work. In your testimony, you note that Twitter conducted a comprehensive review of platform activity related to the 2016 election. I assume that after your preview, you felt that Twitter had a responsibility to make changes to the way your platform operates to address future attempts at election manipulation. Is that correct? Yes, we, we are working, and this is our number one priority to help protect the integrity of 2018 elections. Uh, 
further, Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Chairman, I might ask unanimous consent to submit three articles into the record. Uh, one from uh, January 19th, recode.net, cnbc.com, uh, April 5th, 2018, and from techcrunch.com, um, August 21st, 2018. Without objection. The first article, uh, Mr. Dorsey, um, says that Twitter admits that there were more Russian trolls on its site during the 2016 U.S. presidential election as reported by Recode.net, January 1, 2018. Is that correct? Was this a revelation that Twitter shared? Yes. Did that lead to some, uh, was that an outcome of the, some of the research? Uh, that, that was an outcome of the continued work um, as we dug deeper into uh, the numbers in 2016. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, is it also correct, as was reported by CNBC on uh, April 5th, 2018, that Twitter has suspended more than 1.2 million terrorism-related accounts since yes. late 2015? Correct. Yes. How did that work come about? Uh, we have uh, we've been working for years to automatically identify uh, terrorist accounts and terrorist-like activity from violent extremist groups um, and autom automatically um, shutting that down. Um, and that has been ongoing work for, for years. I would hope that this committee would commend your work in closing those accounts. Lastly, uh, Mr. Dorsey, Facebook and Twitter remove hundreds of accounts linked to Iranian and Russian political meddling. This was reported August 21st, 2018. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Dorsey, are you aware of any significant legislation that Congress has passed to protect our democracy and our elections? Uh, I'm not aware. The reason you're not aware is because none of it, it's, it's not happened. We've not done anything in this Congress. Mr. Dorsey, after it was revealed that 87 million Facebook users' data was improperly shared with Cambridge Analytica, this committee heard testimony from Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. This was in April of this year. It's now September. Are you aware of any significant privacy legislation that passed this committee since Mr. Zuckerberg's testimony? No. Again, nothing's happened. Mr. Chairman, We've not done anything as well for the 148 million people that were impacted by Equifax. I think we should use this committee's time to make a difference in the lives of the American people and live up to the commitments that this committee has made gentlemen's to provide protections for our consumers. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for coming today. Uh, earlier this year, and we just referred to it uh, uh, some in testimony, uh, the FDA commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb, reported that there were, quote, offers to sell illegal drugs all over social media, including Twitter, and the easy, the easy availability and online purchases of these products from illegal drug peddlers is rampant and fuels the opioid crisis, close quote. Now, Mr. Dorsey, do you believe that your Twitter's platform and your controls has contributed to fueling the opioid crisis? Uh, well, first and foremost, we do have strong terms of service that prevent this activity, um, and we are taking enforcement actions when we see it. Okay, well, there was a, a recent study just published by the American Journal of Public Health that analyzed over a five-month period of time the Twitter accounts uh, and went through several thousands, hundreds of thousands of those, and, and found that there were still 2,000 illegal drug sites being sold on your, on your account. Um, do you think that, um, so my curiosity now from, now that we have this report in our hand about the 2,000, do you think, it, or do your, are your websites uh, state that this is prohibited? It's yes. against your standards, and you just said that. Can you tell me how many of these sites are still up? Uh, I can't. I can't tell you. I'd have to follow up with you on the exact data. But they shouldn't be up, right? They shouldn't be. It, it is prohibited uh, if, activity. If I could, just within the last hour, Mr. Dorsey, within the last hour, here's an ad for cocaine on Twitter. It's still up, and and it goes on in this. It says that, you know, not only from that, on that site, they can buy cocaine, heroin, meth, ecstasy, Percocet. I, I would be ashamed if I were you. When you say this is against your public policy and you've got ways of being able to filter that out and it's still getting on there. So I, I'm, I'm astounded that that information is still there. Uh, and then we have the next commercial. This is, on, this is one on cocaine. Uh, here's the next one. 
uh, that here you can get, contact us for any medicine you want. That doesn't say you have to have a prescription. Contact these people, and it's on your site. And you've said you've got ways of checking that. Just within the last hour, it's still up there. We ran into the same problem with Facebook, and Zuckerberg came back to me within two hours later, and it all come down. They took them off. They weren't aware. They had missed it. Their algorithm had missed it. I'm hoping that in the hours after this hearing, you will get back to us and tell us that these are down as well, that you're serious about this opioid epidemic. I just happen to come from a state that's very hard hit with this. We don't need to have our social media promoting the use of illegal drugs on our children and our families. So I hope I hear from you that you will be taking them down. Is that a fair statement? Yes, I, and, I agree with you. This is unacceptable and we will, we will act. I would also hope that, 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 you, that you would move the same resources that have complicated so much of what this, this hearing has been about today so that you can focus on this to make sure that this doesn't happen again, that we wouldn't have to reprimand you to follow the guidelines that you've published and you're so proud about that you have the ways of stopping opioid sales, but it's not happening. So please take a good hard look at it and be serious about this this next time. Thank you very much. Thank I yield you. back. Gentleman yields Thank back. You. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Ms. Loebsack, for four minutes for questions. I thank the chair and ranking member for having this oversight hearing today, and I thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. You've exhibited a lot of patience. You've been very diplomatic, and I, I commend you for that. Um, and there have been a lot of great issues brought up, you know, what, what our what the most recent colleague here from West Virginia mentioned. I think that's a very, very important issue. It's something that's affecting rural America as well as urban America as well, where I'm from. And uh, I think it... I think this discussion today really has demonstrated how important Twitter is to our national conversation, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, uh, and for our democracy. And I'm glad we're shining a light on many issues of concern to Americans across the country with regard to Twitter and the role it plays in our society today and will continue to play into the future, obviously. And many of my colleagues have raised legitimate concerns about data privacy, the influence of hostile actors in our elections, and the spread of misinformation that can distort and harm our very democracy. I think these are all important issues, but I want to focus for a second uh, on the issue of online harassment and the use of Twitter by teenagers, by young, by young people. Social media use among the under 18 population continues to increase, as you know, and while reaching online communities may allow young people to find friendship and community in ways we could not have imagined growing up, I certainly wouldn't have imagined, Twitter may also be creating unimaginable crises for many kids, as I'm sure you're aware. Social media in general, and Twitter specifically, has been used frequently for abusive purposes like harassment and cyberbullying. Bullying. And Twitter has too often been too slow to respond when victims report abuse and harassment. And these interactions, which adults might view as merely stressful and hurtful, uh, when we look at our Twitter account, there are things that are said that might hurt our feelings, whatever the case may be. Uh, for young people, these can be devastating, as we know, because they're still developing and often place large importance on their reputations with their peers. We've seen too many tragic stories of what can happen when individuals move or feel moved to harm themselves in response to online harassment. And it should be a goal of all of us to stop that kind of bullying. So, Mr. Dorsey, my first question is, as part of the healthiness of conversations on Twitter, are you making any specific changes to the experience of your youngest users? Yeah, we, yes, we, uh, we agree with all your points. And this is one of our um, areas of focus is uh, around harassment in particular um, and how it is used and weaponized as a tool to silence others. Um, and the most important thing for us is that we need to be able to measure our progress around it and understand if we're actually making any progress whatsoever. So there, there is a minimum age of 13, is that correct? That yes. you're now trying to enforce? Yes. Uh, uh, does Twitter put any safety checks on the accounts of teenage users? Uh, we, we, do have, we, do, we do have various safety checks and we can follow up with your team on that. That would be good. Um, does Twitter do anything to look for indications of harmful or dangerous interactions? Yes. Specifically? Yes. It'd be good to know that, I appreciate that what those are specifically. Has Twitter conducted any research with outside independent organizations to determine how it can best combat 
on online harassment, bullying, or other harmful interactions, either for children or teenagers or for other groups of people? We do this through our Trust and Safety Council, so we do have uh, an organization that represents youth on digital platforms. And will you commit to publishing a discreet review with outside organizations to help evaluate what more Twitter can be doing to protect our kids? We, we haven't yet, um, but we will certainly work with our partners to, uh, to consider this. Because I think your three principles, impartiality, transparency, and accountability, I think we can put those into effect and operationalize those when it comes to these particular questions that I've asked you. And so I really do appreciate your time, and uh, we can, ex when, we can uh, expect such a review to be provided to the public then in the future? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, and I yield back, Mr. Thank Chair. you. Thank the gentleman from Iowa. Recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for four minutes. Thank you very much. I'm here. Thank you for uh, being here today. I appreciate it. I've had to manage uh, the floor debates. I've been over in the Capitol building most of the afternoon. I apologize as a conflict of scheduling, but glad to be here. And I know that I missed some of your answers and some of the, the, what we've talked about previously, but I want to uh, further go down the path of, on a couple of things. So, but many of my constituents who use Twitter perceive it to be an open market of ideas that you have referred to in your testimony. And we're obviously here today because some questions have been raised about the rules for posting content and whether some viewpoints are restricted in practice, specifically political conservatives. So I'll, I'll come to a question on editory judgment, but one major issue for my constituents start with transparency and how their data is being collected and used by Twitter. Understand you've spoken about data a few times already this afternoon. So to build on those previous questions asked by my colleagues, what specific data points are collected on Twitter users and with whom do you share them? Um, so we infer uh, interest around usage. So when people follow particular accounts that represent interest in basketball or politics, for instance, um, we can uh, utilize that information to introduce them to new tweets that might be similar or accounts that might be similar as well. Um, so a lot of our inference of, uh, of that data is uh, interest. This is all viewable within the settings of the app. So you can see all the interests that we've inferred about you within the settings. And you can also turn them off or delete them. Is that shared with outside parties? Uh, it's not. It's not shared. It's only used by Twitter. Yeah. And how do you obtain consent from users if, so you're not shared with any third party, so you don't have to go through the consent and do that, okay. When it comes to questions of editorial judgment, and I'm not an expert on section 230, but I'd like to ask you about your thoughts on publisher liability. Could you comment on what some have said, that there is a certain amount of inherent editorial judgment being carried out when Twitter uses artificial intelligence driven algorithms or promotes content through Twitter moments? And the questions would be, so where should we draw the line on how much editorial judgment can be exercised by the owner of a neutral platform like Twitter before the platform is considered a publisher? Well, we do uh, defend Section 230 because it is the thing that enables us uh, to increase the health in the first place. Um, it enables us to look at the content, look for abuse, uh, and uh, take enforcement actions uh, against them accordingly. We do have a section of the service um, called Moments, um, where we do have curators who are looking through all of the relevant tweets for a particular event or a topic and arranging them. And they use a internal uh, guideline to make sure that we are representative of uh, as many perspectives as possible. Going back to the, uh, that, that concept of variety of perspective, we, we wanna see a balanced view of what people think about a particular issue. Not all of them will, will be as balanced as others, but that's how they measure themselves against. But it is one area um, that uh, people can choose to use or, or ignore altogether. Okay, thanks. And then finally, a few seconds left. Uh, some people say, and I've heard some people say, that, that Twitter could be classified as a media outlet due to certain content agreements. You may have now or consider in the future. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I, I don't think the, you know, the broader categories are necessarily useful. Um, we, we do see our role as, uh, as serving conversation. Like we do see our, our, our product as a conversational product, a communication product. And uh, we do see a lot of people use Twitter to get the news because we believe that news is a byproduct of public conversation. And, uh, it allows to see a much broader view of what's currently happening and, and what's going on. So 
Um, that's what we're focusing on is how, how do people use us rather than these, these categories. We, we do have partnerships um, where we stream events like this one. This one is live on Twitter right now where people can have a conversation about um, and everyone can benefit and engage in that conversation accordingly. Thank you, and my time's expired, and I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for uh, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for your, over here. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, I know you were uh, over on the Senate side earlier today, so thank you for uh, enduring all these long hours of questioning. Um, wanted to kind of just make sure we were clear on a couple of things. One, uh, you've talked uh, at length, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail, about the mechanisms that you use to um, to look at different aspects of content on the site. Um, but you've also talked about how your algorith algorithms have, um, are a bit imperfect, how they have impacted some members of this body, um, Democrats and Republicans, is that true? Yes. And you've also indicated that there are others that get caught up in that, liberal activists that use perhaps profane language um, in response to political leaders, is that true? Uh, that, that may or may not be a signal that we, we use in terms of the content. We tend to favor more of the behavior that we're seeing. And that's what I was describing in terms of um, the signal was the behavior of the people following these accounts. Fair enough. Um, you yourself were actually suspended at a time. Was that not true? I was. Um, so fair to say that sometimes that there, uh, there are errors. Yes, there, there are, are errors, unless you engage in that obstructive behavior of your own site, which you did not, right? I'm sorry? Unless you engaged in that own destructive behavior that you were talking about, which I don't think you did. Correct. Right. So um, you talked about essentially depending on those automated tools and then individual users to report uh, tweets, behavior, one of these horrifying instances with Ms. McCain. But that's basically the, the regu self-regulation mechanisms that you all use, right? Yeah, we're, our, our model currently depends upon reports to remove content or to remove accounts. And why is it that you depend on those reports rather than having a more robust network within your company to do that? Why is it that you, that you basically outsource that to users? Well, we, um, we, we don't feel great about this. We don't believe that the burden should be on the victim in the first place. So this is something we'd like to change. We, we have to build that technology. And but if you change that, right, if you, I understand you don't feel great about putting that on the victims or the observers, but you also express a reticence for your company to be the arbiter as to what is decent, fair, truth. You mentioned the term false fact earlier in your testimony. I have no idea what a false fact is, but putting that aside for a second, how, how it seems like you're trying to basically meld this world of outside kind of crowdsourcing what's, what, what works versus internalizing some of it. I, I want to try to push you on that in a minute and a half, which is not exactly fair, but how, as you say you're trying to fix it, what are you trying to do? What does that look like? We're, we're trying to um, build proactive systems that uh, are recognizing behaviors that are against our terms of service and take action much, much, much faster so that people don't have to report them. And is that, you, one of my Republican colleagues asked earlier, I believe, how many folks you have working on that. You said the issue wasn't so much how many people, but you deflected that a bit. Understanding the uncertain uh, technology can advance here, but. Is that two people? Is it 20 people? Is it 200 people? Do you expect to be hiring more here? That's got to be some sort of reflection of an area of, of focus, right? Yeah, we, we, we have hundreds of people working on it, but the, the reason I, I don't want to focus on that number is because we need to have the flexibility to make decisions between investing to, to build more new technology or hiring people. And in my experience, companies naturally just want to grow. And that isn't always the right answer because it doesn't allow for uh, a lot of scalability. All right, sir, thank you, you're back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for four minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Dorsey, thank you again for coming in here. Um, recognizing that there's multiple swords to free speech. There's good and bad that comes with it. Uh, I think it's important to also mention that Twitter, as well as other social media platforms, has been key in liberating oppressed people and allowing oppressed people to communicate. If you look in Syria, although that situation is not good over there, people have been able to get their message out. When chemical weapons attacks happen, we know about that very quickly because government censored media 
which would never report a chemical weapons attack, is usurped by Twitter use and Facebook and some of these others. So uh, part of a very big concern with that, too, is also foreign interference in our democracy. Um, we're very concerned, I'm very concerned, about the role that the Russians played in attempting to undermine democracy. I, I don't think Russia elected President Trump, but I think it's obvious they're trying to sow instability in democracy. And, uh, and so I think the more we can get a grip on that, this and a grasp and make people aware of just the fact of what's happening, we can begin to inoculate ourselves. Uh, I'd like to ask you, though, about Twitter's practices with respect to information sharing with foreign governments. It's a topic I addressed in the Facebook hearing with Mr. Zuckerberg and in which I think Senator Rubio broached with you a little earlier today. Uh, on September 1st, 2015, Russian federal law number 242FZ, known by many as the data localization law, went into effect. It requires social media companies offering service to Russian citizens to collect and maintain all personal information of those citizens on databases physically located in their country. Is Twitter in compliance with this law? Uh, I need to follow up with you on that. You, you don't know if you're in compliance with that law right now? Which, which law again? Uh, it's the Russian federal law 242FZ, which requires the data localization, requires storage of information to be kept in Russia. This has been in the news for a couple of years now, so I, I would hope you would know. Um, I, I don't. I need, I need my team to follow up with you on that. You got a bunch of people back there. You can ask them if I... We don't have servers in Russia. You don't, you do not have, no. okay. So you're not technically in compliance, which I think is good. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'll answer my second question. If you store user data, because data, there'd be concern about breaches and everything else in dealing with Russia. And besides, and uh, legitimate and well-defined requests for data that may aid in the investigation of a crime, does Twitter make any user data available to Russian state entities, including intelligence and security agencies? No. Let me ask you then, uh, we, we've touched on this a, a few times with the minute I have left. Uh, parents, young adults, teenagers using Twitter, uh, I think our laws haven't caught up with the new reality, the 21st century that we're in. Um, that we have to address how technology can be used to hurt innocent people. In Illinois, there's laws to prevent people from distributing personal photos with malicious intent. A fake account can be created a matter of minutes to slander someone and, uh, and do damage and, and circulate photos. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg testified before this committee that he that Facebook is responsible for the content on Facebook, which I think you can appreciate how newsworthy that was given the longstanding interpretations of Section 230. Your user agreement clearly states that all content is the sole responsibility of the person who originated such content. You may not monitor or control the content posted via services, and we cannot take responsibility for the content. But your corrective actions and the statements you've made a little bit seem to be somewhat in conflict with the language. You, can you just take a little bit of time with what we have left to clarify your stance on content? Uh, in what regard? Just, I mean, are users responsible? Is Twitter, is it mixed? What area does Twitter have a responsibility? Or when yeah. you step in, why? So, so people are responsible for their content. We have made our singular objective to as a company to help improve the health of the content that we see on the service. And for us, that means that uh, people are not using uh, content to silence others or to harass others or to bully each other so that they don't even feel safe to participate in the first place. Um, and, and that is what CDA 230 protects us to do is to actually uh, enforce uh, these actions, make them clear to people in our terms of service but also to enforce them so that we can take actions. Okay. Uh, I'm out of time, so you'll... Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardenas, for four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, for participating in this important uh, matter. Um, I want to follow up on some of Mr. Lobsack's line of questioning. Um, while the President and the Republicans are criticizing social media, I think it's to whip up their base. There are real issues, such as the shocking number of teens that are reporting being bullied bullied. Physical playground bullying is, is bad enough, but increasingly uh, this cruelty is moving online where one click of a button sends a hateful words and images that can be seen by hundreds or even thousands of people at a time. Uh, people, kids, are being targeted for being who they are or for being a certain race or a certain sexual orientation and so on. We know it's pervasive. It's a pervasive problem. The First Lady has made combating cyberbullying a national priority. 
oddly enough. At the same time, adults are not giving kids a great example to follow. Public p figures, including the president, spew inflammatory, harmful words every day. These actions cannot be erased and may follow their victims and families forever. For example, um, how does it feel to be in front of us for hours at a time? You, I'm enjoying the conversation. Yeah, but do you get to go home? Do you get to do what you choose to do once you leave this room? Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what's incredibly important for us to, to think about when we think about bullying online, because it's inescapable, really. And that's really an issue that, that is uh, new to us as human beings, and certainly with platforms like yours, it's made possible. Uh, so it can take many forms. Uh, it can be hurtful. It's about words. It's about appearances. It's about many, many things. So I think it's really important that uh, the public understands that something needs to be done about it. And what can be done is something that hopefully we can come to terms with, with uh, you over at Twitter and uh, with all the millions of people. As uh, very public examples, for example, celebrities uh, such as 14-year-old Millie Robbie Brown, Kelly Marie Tran, Ariel Winter, and Ruby Rose have stopped using Twitter or taken breaks from Twitter because their intense, uh, the intensified bullying that they experienced on the platform had persisted. If Twitter couldn't or wouldn't help these public figures, how does it deal with all the kids who are, aren't famous? I want to know how you handle bullying claims for American families who are not in the news. Um, you have explained that Twitter investigates when it, is, when it gets a report of behavior such as that, it, behavior that crosses the line into abuse, including behavior that harasses, intimidates, or uses fear to silence other voices. How many reports of cyberbullying does Twitter receive each month? That's my first question. We, we don't disclose that data, but we can follow up with you. Okay, appreciate you reporting to the committee uh, on that uh, answer. How about Periscope? Uh, the, the same. The same? Okay. Look forward to that answer submitted to the committee. And how many of those reports are for accounts of people age 18 or younger? Uh, uh, in, in what, what regard? The um, Periscope or Twitter? Is it, do you ever take into account whether or not it's a report uh, to somebody who's uh, been attacked who are 18 years or younger? Uh, we um, will have to follow up with you on that. We don't have the same sort of demographic data that our peers do because um, we, we are not a, a service of profiles, uh, but, of, but of conversation. Yeah. It makes it even more critical for us to understand that. Um, what actions are taken in response to these reports, and how long does it take for Twitter to take such a response? We, um, we, we rank according to the severity of the report. Um, and uh, again, this is something that we need to improve to understand the severity of each report and how that um, is ranked so we can move much faster. And ultimately, we, we don't want the uh, reporting burden to be on the victim. We want to do it automatically. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman. And we now turn to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for four minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, you being here, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, I represent that portion of Virginia that's in the southwest corner and borders a big chunk of southern West Virginia. And so I have some questions uh, uh, similar to uh, Mr. McKinley's questions because we're suffering from a, a huge opioid problem, but drugs in general. And so I, I know you're, you're trying and you're working on it and you're looking for things, but last year in, a, in an edition of Scientific American, they talked about having artificial intelligence scan Twitter for signs of opioid abuse. And it would seem to me that on something that's an Ill illegal conduct, if somebody is selling drugs, that's not just an inconvenience you're trying to judge whether it's truly, you know, something that's, that's bad or it's illegal. It would seem to me that you all ought to be able to deploy an, an artificial intelligence platform that would knock down anybody trying to sell illegal substances on your platform. Can you uh, address that? Yes, we, I mean, we, we have, um we have, uh, we have to prioritize all of our models, um, and we have been well, prioritizing. Shouldn't illegal be at the very top of that model? Absolutely, um, but we, we have been prioritizing a lot of what we saw in 2016 and 2017 in terms of election interference um, and uh, our readiness for 2018. That does not say- So here's what I got. I got people writing me whose kids have died because they've, they've, been, they've been in treatment, they, they have a relapse, and one of the easiest ways to get in there is to get on social media. And, you know, if 
scientists can use artificial intelligence to track opioid abuse in this country. It would seem to me you ought to be able to track illegal sales with artificial intelligence. Now, wouldn't you agree with that, yes or no? I agree with that. It's horrible and, uh, and definitely something we need to address as soon as possible. I appreciate that very much. Now, look, I don't think there's a conspiracy. I think that there's a lot of folks out there, though, that, that may not uh, have that many conservative friends who might be living in your neighborhood or living in the area that you live in. And I looked at your advisory council, and there may be some right-leaning groups, but I didn't see any right groups in there that would, you know, look, we're not all crazy on the right. Get, get in there and find some groups that can help out in, on your advisory council. Also, I would say to you, and I said this to uh, Mr. Zuckerberg when he was here, it seems to me that if, if you don't want the government in there, and I think it's better not to have the government in there telling you all what to do as, as social media, that you all as a group ought to get together and come up with something. 1894, they had this newfangled thing. Electronic devices were coming onto the scene. And an engineer said, you know what, maybe we ought to test all this. And they got the insurance companies and the, and the electric manufacturers together and, and they funded United Laboratories. And as an industry, without government coming in and saying this is what you have to do, they came up with standards. It would seem to me that the social media, particularly the, the big actors like yourself, but others, ought to come together, figure out something that's a, a template that works for all to make sure that we're not having political bias, because I really do believe you when you say that, that y'all aren't trying to do it, but it's happening anyway, and I think it's an accident. I'm not, I'm not trying to assess blame, but I'm saying you've got to help us, because I don't think it's good for uh, the internet or social media to have the government laying down rules that may or may not make sense. But somebody's got to do something because we need to protect privacy, as you've heard, and we need to make sure there's not any political bias, intentional or unintentional. Uh, would it's you agree idea. with that? It's a great idea. Uh, and, and that is why we want to be a lot more open around um, these health indicators that we're developing. And we don't see this as a competition. And last but not least, one of the questions that's come up as I've been discussing this issue with a lot of folks is, if you, if you do put the kibosh on somebody's uh, post or somebody's uh, Twitter account, can you at least tell them about it so that they have some idea so they can do the appeal? Because if, if they don't know about it, they're not likely to appeal, are they? Yes, we, uh, we need a much more robust way of communicating what happened and why, and also a much more robust appeals process. Thank you very much. My time's up. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. You've turned now to the gentleman from California, Mr. Peters, for uh, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. You know, I don't know if anyone else has mentioned the um, breathtaking irony that Donald Trump is complaining about Twitter. Um, it's hard for me to imagine that he would have done nearly as well as he did without your platform, uh, and um, he's a master of using it. Um, I think it has done some wonderful things for democracy. It's democratized democracy in many ways. Uh, we saw that here in the House when we um, live streamed the protest over guns in 2016. It brought people into the chamber in a way that I think none of us had imagined before. Um, I use it a lot uh, just to stay connected back home in San Diego. I find out what's going on uh, every day in the local government, in the local activities. I follow my baseball team's promising minor leagues through it, and I think it's been a, it's been a great platform. The problem with when anyone can be on your platform, though, is that now everyone's a journalist. And I just want to explore in that context your discussion of the term fairness. Um, can you, do you, have you written down what you mean by fairness? And what I'm sort of getting at is, you, know, you have these allegations about facts versus false equivalency that journalism's been, been dealing with, I think, uh, more successfully recently, um, trying to provide truth rather than balance. Is that something that goes into your calculation of fairness? And what, what kind of standards do you uh, impose on content that's on Twitter? Well, so we want to, we don't, fairness to us means that we are driving more impartial outcomes, which are more objective driven, not, not basing uh, anything on bias. Um, and, uh, and we do want to be able to measure this and also make public uh, what we find. And that's why we kicked off um, this initiative to uh, understand the health of conversation and, uh, and how it might uh, um, trend. One of the, one of the, th one of the indicators that um, we're considering uh, is shared facts. Um, and that is the percentage of conversation that shares the same facts. Um, that is not 
an indication of truth or not, but just what percentage of people participating in a conversation are actually sharing the same facts versus having different facts. And we think a greater collection of shared facts leads to a healthier conversation. So then if we understand the makeup of them currently, how can we help drive more people towards sharing more of the facts? Um, and if we can do that, then we can see a lot more healthy conversations. So that's, that's our intent. But first, we're at the phase where we just need to measure it. Right. Um, and uh, against those four indicators I, I laid out earlier, um, and, and we can send you more of our information and thinking about how we're developing these. I'd love to hear that. One of the problems with everyone having their own facts is it's very hard to have um, conversations about difficult issues. One that I'm concerned about is climate change. If everyone has a different understanding of the facts, it's hard to agree on what to do about it. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes raised the concept of um, th this hearing being a way to work the refs. I don't know if you recall that reference. Is that something that we should be concerned about? Is that something that uh, strikes you as going to have an impact on your business, the notion that we'll be, that the committee would be working the refs through the majority? I, I honestly don't know what that means. So. Okay, good. So the idea is that we will, that uh, they're going to put so much pressure on you to, to, to avoid pressure from us that you'll change your behavior in a way that's, uh, that's not, that's not uh, fair. And is that something we should be concerned about? Well, I mean, I, I think we, um, we've, we've articulated what we think is important and, um, and what we're trying to drive. And I, I see the role of government as being a checkpoint to that and uh, also being a clarifier and asking questions of our path. And, um, you know, I do believe the system is working in that regard. So um, we, uh, you know, we're putting out what we believe is critical for us to focus on. And if there are disagreements uh, in, in mass and feedback we get, we will certainly change our path. Well, I appreciate your testimony today. My time's expired, and thank the chairman. Thank the gentleman. Chair recognized the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bilirakis, for thank you, four Mr. minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Dorsey, I've heard from my local uh, Pasco County School District that's located in the west coast of Florida that is, it has consistently responded to threats of school violence. Uh, I've heard from the superintendent, Kurt Browning, who's doing an outstanding job, that it faced as many as 19 threats in one week. Uh, many of those threats have come from individual tweets. Uh, news reports and studies show this is a widespread pr problem, as you can imagine. What is your company's process for notifying local law enforcement officials and school districts when these threats emerge? Um, we do have outreach to local entities and local, local law enforcement when we see anything impacting someone's physical security. Um, we can follow up with you on exactly what those implementations are. Well, how effective have they been? Um, I don't, I don't, um, I'm not sure how to determine the efficacy, but we can, we can follow up with you on that and, and please share do. what we have. Please do. And uh, would you consider an internal process in which Twitter can work directly with the school districts to address these uh, tweets quickly? Obviously, time is of the essence. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things we're always looking for in, um, is ways to uh, quickly, especially where it impacts physical security, ways to quickly alert us to things that we might be able to help with. Um, in terms of the conversation around it. So we're certainly open to it um, and uh, open to uh, an implementation that we think we can scale. Okay. Let me ask you a question. How did you determine the, and I know social media, Facebook too, the minimum age of use uh, of 13 and uh, are you considering raising that age? Uh, we, uh, I don't believe have considered raising the age, but we do determine it upon sign up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sec next question. According to Twitter's website, Twitter's moments are defined as, quote, and I quote again, curated stories showing the very best of what's happening on Twitter and customized to show you topics that are popular or relevant so you can discover uh, what is unfolding. Uh, again, customized to show you topics and what's relevant. Uh, so you can, again, uh, what is unfolding on Twitter in an instant, and that's an end quote. Uh, in my experience, Twitter moments more often features a specific point of view or political narrative. And the question is, how, you, how are these moments, uh, again, quote, 
moments compiled and prioritized. You said earlier that moments are selected by employees publishing content. What are the internal guidelines the company has set to determine what makes a moment? Yeah, so we, um, we first and foremost take a data-driven approach to how we arrange these moments. And again, these are collections of tweets that we look at based on any particular topic or event. And um, then we bring them into a collection. Uh, and uh, we, we use a data-driven approach, meaning that we are looking for the amount of conversation, first and foremost, that's happening around a particular event. And then as we rank that, then we go into impartiality to make sure that we are looking for opportunities to show as many perspectives as possible. So a variety of perspectives and a high score on variety of perspectives is beneficial um, to uh, the people reading because they can see every side of a particular issue or a particular event. Okay, very good. Uh, I thank you and look forward to you getting some information on, on this particular following up. And uh, we'd like to, to have you back, in my opinion, even though I'm not the chairman, uh, to, to see the progress that you've made with regard to these issues. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Dingle, for four minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, you're actually one of my husband's heroes. I'm uh, married to what we call, fractionally call around here, the dean of Twitter, who, quite frankly, at 92, is better on Twitter than probably everybody in this room, uh, but, which means I know the power of this platform, and I think it's a very important tool. But to those who have been doing conspiracy theories and politicizing this, it is not only Meghan McCain that I, I myself have had some of those same threats and those same caricatures, and quite frankly, was blissfully ignorant until law enforcement brought it to my attention. So I, I would, uh, uh, I do think that the threats that are happening on Twitter do need to be better understood and more quickly acted upon, but I, I would rather ask some questions right now because you're educating all of us and we all need to understand social media better period and its tool in the background. So I'd like to ask some questions about privacy and the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence on the platform. You've spoken about how you are trying to deploy machine learning to combat the disinformation, the harassment, the abuse, but and I wanna build on what some of my other colleagues have said about the black box nature of these algorithms and the lack of what they call accountability, but how we improve it. So building on what actually my colleague, Representative Harper was saying, what type of data sets do you use to train AI and how often do you retrain them? That's a great question. Um, we, um, we try to use data sets that will be predictive of what um, we would expect to see on the service. And as we train these models, uh, we're certainly using um, previous um, experiences and, and, and outputs that we've seen uh, in natural uses of how people use the system. And then also trying to test some edge cases as well. But again, all these tests um, are great and help us understand what to expect, but ultimately they're not really put to test until they're released on production, we actually see um, how people use it, how it's affecting usage, and and also what might be unexpected, which which I talked about earlier. Um, so that is in that's training. There are AI is is not a new field, but the application of AI at scale is rather new, especially to us and in our company. So. There are best practices being developed um, that we are learning as quickly as possible from, um, and more importantly, trying to measure uh, those, those outcomes in terms of bias and impartiality. So as we build on that, do your engineers have an ability to see and understand why an algorithm made certain decisions? That is a great question, because that re goes into another field of research in AI, which is called explainability which is uh, encouraging engineers to write um, a, a function that enables the algorithm to describe how it made the decision and why it made the decision. And I think that is a critical question to ask and one to, to focus on um, because we are offloading more and more of our decisions to these technologies, whether they be 
companies like ours who are offloading our enforcement actions to algorithms or ranking actions to algorithms, or even personally, I'm wearing an Apple Watch right now and it tells me when to stand. I've offloaded a decision to it. And if it can't explain the context to why it made that decision or why it's taking that action, it becomes quite scary. So I, I do believe that is a valid, um, a valid form, but it is extremely early in terms of research, uh, this concept of explainability, but I, I think it, it, will, it will be one that um, bears the greatest fruit in terms of trust. The record, because I'm gonna be out of, I'm out of time. You've talked about how these organs have missed things. It's made mistakes. What is an acceptable, acceptable error rate? You, you can do that for the record later, but we'll I come think back. it's very we'll important. Come back late. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for four minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Dorsey. Thank you for, uh, for being here today. Is it, is it uh, safe to say that, that an algorithm is, is essentially a decision tree that once it's turned into software, it operates on a data set as input and it produces a desired action or result. Is that, would that, that be a good layman's term of, of what an algorithm is? For, for a general algorithm, yes, but it gets a lot more complicated. I know it gets a lot more complicated than that, and I'm gonna get into the complication. Uh, you know, there's a, I'm a software engineer by, by trade, and I've written thousands and thousands of algorithms. There's, a, there's as much art that goes into writing an algorithm as there is science. Uh, would you agree with that? I agree with that. So, and essentially, there's, there's, there's a part of the heart of the algorithm writer that's writing that algorithm, correct? Um, in, in I mean, if you've got a painter, you got, if you put 10 painters in 10 different rooms and say, paint me a picture of a tree, you're going to get Charlie Brown's Christmas tree in one room. You're going to get a tree with an oak tree and a swing and grass underneath it. You're going to get 10 different pictures of a tree. If you ask 10 software engineers to develop you an algorithm, you're going to get 10 different solutions to solve that problem, right? Which is why testing is so important. Which is why testing is so important. What kind of peer outcome. testing do you guys do with your algorithms to make sure that uh, that, that innate bias, that's inevitable because you've, it's already been admitted that Twitter has got bias in its algorithms because you've acknowledged that and you've tried to correct it. So how do you go about weeding out that innate bias? Do you do any peer reviews of your algorithms before you, before you uh, send them to production? We, we do do those internally, yes. Well, can't you, uh, can't you modify your algorithms, uh, especially in this age of artificial intelligence, to be more uh, intelligent in identifying and alerting on specific things. I mean, we got in the automotive industry today, we've got artificial intelligence and in automobiles that doesn't just tell you that there's a car in front of you. It actually puts the brakes on. It takes some action and it's instantaneous because it saves lives. Is it unreasonable to think that, that Twitter could not modify its algorithms to hit on, uh, on illegal drug sales, on uh, uh, violent uh, terminology and those kinds of things and make faster alerts to, uh, to, to stop some of this? Not, not unreasonable at all. It's just a matter of work and doing the work and, and that is our Okay, focus. well, I'd submit to you that you need to do that work and you need to get to it pretty quick. Let me ask you another quick question. The trending topics list is, a, is an important issue and I want to under understand that one. Can you... Uh, can you tell me how uh, a topic is uh, uh, determined to be trending? Give me some specific. Uh, what's it based on? Well, so in, in, a, in a tweet, when you use a particular keyword or hashtag, um, when the system notices that those are used in mass and aggregate, um, it, recognizing, it recognizes that there's a, a velocity shift uh, in the number of times people are tweeting about a particular hashtag or trend and it identifies those and then puts them on that trending topic list. Now there, there is a default setting where we personalize those trending topics for you. And that is the default. So when you first come on to Twitter, trending topics are personalized to you and it's personalized based on the accounts you follow and how you engage with tweets and whatnot. Basically, you know, we, we could show you all the trending topics happening in the world, but not all of them are going to be relevant to you. We take the ones 
that are relevant to you and, and rank them accordingly. So it's trending based on what's relevant to you, essentially. Correct. Okay, I, I, my time is up, but let me just say, say this, and I said this to Mr. Zuckerberg. You know, in the absence of, of massive federal regulations telling you guys how to do your business, the responsibility bar goes really, really high. And, and I think coming back to what Mr. Griffith says, I, I think you guys need to look at, a, at an outside um, um, entity of some sort to help you bounce off ideas of how to address this stuff before, before legal or market forces drive you to a place that you're not going to want to go. Gentleman's time. I yield expired. back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for all the time you've given the committee. Um, I want to echo my dismay that our Republican colleagues have chosen to hold this hearing to rile up their base and give credence to unsupported conspiracies when uh, there are real issues here that run to the heart of our civic life that deserve our immediate attention. Um, it is an um, unfortunate and a missed opportunity on behalf of our majority. Now, Mr. Dorsey, I know that Twitter has said it is taking steps to help make political advertising more transparent on the platform and is now working uh, to do something similar uh, with issue ads. Um, unfortunately, looking at Twitter today, I am concerned that even for political ads, you haven't made anything clear necessarily uh, to consumers. On some platforms, and Facebook for an example, um, if a user visits a, politi a political or politician's website, that user can immediately see all the advertisement that she or he has purchased on the platform. On Twitter, I have to find a separate resource, the Ads Transparency Center, and then search for the politician to see what promotion she or he purchased in the past. It is difficult to find and seems ill-advised, particularly when your competitors are doing it differently and perhaps better. So did Twitter do any research regarding how best to make election advertising information available to its consumers? We, um, we, we did do some research, but um, this is not a, a stopping point for us. So we, we want to continue to make ad transparency um, something that is uh, meeting our customers where they are um, so that it is relevant, so it's easy to get to. We, we did some things a little bit differently. Um, we, we have launched the issue ads uh, feature of the ad transparency as well. Um, but we also enabled anyone, even without a Twitter account, to search Twitter ads to see w who is behind them and also the targeting criteria that are used. Thank you. And have you kept any s statistics that you can share with this committee today about how often average consumers uh, even search the Ads Transparency Center? Uh, we do keep statistics and, and track usage of all of our products. Um, we can certainly follow up with your office to, to give you some relevant information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I know that you said this is not a stopping point that you're still exploring, but why is it that it appears that, that you're making it harder for Americans to see who's trying to influence them? That's, that's not our intention. And, uh, we, you know, we do, we do need, know we need to make I do a lot more work to meet people where they are. And in the interface, there's just some design choices that we need to make in order to do this the right way. Well, what's more, it seems that political advertising information that Twitter makes available only shows advertisements served in the past seven days. Is that correct? Um, I don't, I'm not aware right now of the constraints on it, but we'll follow up with you. Okay, but if that is correct, that seems vastly insufficient given that political campaigns in the U.S. last months, if not years. So, Mr. Dorsey, why doesn't your platform reflect that insight and disclose political advertising beyond seven days, if that indeed we'll, is the we'll look into time that. frame? Okay, I appreciate that immensely, and I thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chair, the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlemen. We now go to the uh, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Thank Long, you. for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. Uh, I think it's pretty easy to understand why you've been as successful as you have, because uh, your mannerisms today, your decorum, a lot of people come into these hearings and they practice and they coach them and they tell them how to act. It's obvious that no one did that for you. You are who you are and that shows today and I think that that has a lot to do with how successful you've been. So thank you for your time and being here today. Thank you. Um, 
I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Bilirak has asked you about moments. I'm not sure exactly what moments are, but when my staff got a hold of me a couple of days ago, they said, well, what do you want to ask Mr. Dorsey? Where do you want to take this? What direction? Do a little research. And I just, you know, off the top of my head, I said, well, let me send you some stuff. So I started shooting them emails. And these are emails that I received. They're called highlights, as you're familiar with, daily, uh, daily highlights to my personal Twitter account about the most interesting content from Twitter that is tailored just for me. And uh, when we're talking about impartiality and, uh, you know, somebody said the Republicans are all full of conspiracy theories over here, I just want you to, you know, you're a thoughtful guy, I just want you to take into consideration what I'm going to say and do with it what you want to. But if you're saying, hey, we're impartial, we really are, this, that, and the other, uh, out of the, I pulled, I just started firing off emails to my ledge director, and I sent him eight, uh, four, excuse me, <coughs> 14 emails of highlights that were sent to me just in the last few days. And I guess, I don't know, it might have been over 14 days. I don't know how often you send them, but there's six highlighted tweets per email. So that's a total of 84 recent examples that you all picked down and said, hey, this conservative congressman from Missouri, and thank goodness you're a Cardinal fan, but, uh, and you being from Missouri, but, uh, this conservative congressman, we found out what this guy wants to read, and here it is. Twelve of them of the 84 were from Glenn Thrush, reporter for the New York Times. Maggie Halberman, you sent me nine from her, White House correspondent for the New York Times, political analyst for CNN. Chris Cezilla, political commentator for CNN. David Frum, senior editor at The Atlantic and MSNBC contributor. Nicole Wallace, current anchor of Deadline White House and chief political analyst for N MSNBC and NBC News. Sam Stein, former political editor of the Huffington Post, political, politics editor at the Daily Beast, and MSNBC contributor. Uh, Rep. Eric Swalwell, Democratic congressman from California's 15th District. Robert Costa, national political reporter for the Washington Post, a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Caitlin Collins, White House correspondent for CNN. Mike, Michael Schmidt, New York Times correspondent contributor to MSNBC and NBC. Tommy Veter, former spokesman for President Obama. David Korn, MSNBC analyst and author of the Russian Roulette book. Casey Hunt, NS, or NBC News correspondent, host of N MSNBC show. Uh, Richard Painter, commentator on MSNBC and CNN, outspoken critic of Trump. David Axelrod, commentator for CNN, former chief strategist for Obama's campaign, senior advisor to Obama. I did not cherry pick these. Here's a Republican, a former Republican. I'm not sure what he is now, but you did send me one from Bill Kristol founder and editor of the, of the At Large Weekly and a vocal supporter and a never Trump, never Trumper guy. And you did send me another one from a uh, Fox News, I'll put that in there, Britt Hume, senior political analyst for Fox News Channel. I want to submit these for the record so you can peruse them at your leisure. That's the only two I remember being Republican Crystal and out of 84 that were handpicked tailored for me because they know what I want to read. But uh, Glenn Th Thrush, Chris Cezilla, they, it just goes on and on. I have, I guess, 14 pages of them here. And they're all pretty much Trump bashing. They're all pretty much Trump bashing. I mean, if you just go right down the line, uh, one after another. So just, if you will, take that into consideration. And again, I do. And I think that there was a fake news tweet sent out yesterday by a guy that was sitting here earlier, and he's not here anymore. But John Gizzi, reporter John Gizzi, sent out a fake news tweet yesterday. He said he was headed to the Nationals Park and he was going to watch him beat the Cardinals. That was fake news. <laughs> I yield back. Thank you. It doesn't sound like we served you well in matching your interests. Gentlemen, time's expired. Uh, Chair will recognize Ms. Schakowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, while you've been sitting here all day, we appreciate that. Um, the, um, according to the Wall Street Journal, the Justice Department to examine whether social media giants are, quote, intentionally stifling, unquote, some viewpoints. And uh, it quotes the, uh, the, the, the president. Um, it says that in an interview Wednesday morning with the Daily Caller, Mr. Trump accused social media companies of interfering in elections in favor of Democrats, quote, the truth is, they were all on Hillary Clinton's side, he said. 
Um, would you agree with that characterization by the, uh, by the president? No. Um, the other thing it says in this article is that they expressed, uh, referring to both, the, you're hearing the, uh, I guess it's in the Senate, um, the, they expressed contrition for allowing the, their platform to be abused in the past while pledging to uh, make protecting the system from uh, uh, the system from during the 2018 midterm elections a priority. Um, first of all, I just want to say about contrition. Um, we heard from Facebook um, CEO, Mr. Zuckerberg, um, one example after another after another through the years, you haven't been there that long at Twitter, um, of contrition. We're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. But even today, if I had listed, well, we made a mistake, we're going to do better, etc. So first let me ask you, what are you going to do to make sure that the election is not in some way um, influenced by foreign governments in an inappropriate way? Well, this is, this is our number one priority in, in our information quality efforts. I hear that. And our, our broader health. Um, and we have benefited from learning from recent elections like the Mexican election, and we're able to test and refine a bunch of that work accordingly. So we are doing a few things. First, we're opening portals um, that allow uh, partners and journalists to report anything suspicious that they see so that we can take much faster action. Second, we are utilizing more technology to identify where people are trying to artificially amplify information to steer or detract a conversation. Um, third, we have a much stronger partnership with law enforcement and federal law enforcement uh, to make sure that we are getting a regular cadence of meetings, that we are seeing more of the trends going on, and that we can understand intent behind these accounts and activities so that we can act much faster as well. Well, I appreciate that because that's where the emphasis ought to be. I have to tell you, the president and the Republicans have concocted this idea of a supposed anti-conservative bias to, it seems to me, distract from the fact that, the, um, that, that their majority has absolutely done nothing to prevent foreign governments from using social media platforms to spread misinformation. And if we don't do that, then I think our do that, then I think our democracy itself is actually at stake. But also, in terms of your motives, Mr. Dorsey, the majority of Twitter's revenue comes from selling advertising on the platform, right? Correct. And Twitter is a for-profit, publicly traded company. Is that right? Correct. And generally speaking, businesses, political campaigns, and other advertisers choose to advertise on Twitter because Twitter promises to deliver target, targeted, high, highly engaged audience. Is that agree? Is that what you'd say? Correct. So you actually said that you are incentivized. It says Twitter is incentivized to keep all voices on the platform. Is that correct? No. We, that, that, is, that is where we... We need to make sure that we're questioning our incentives, but also we understand that making health our top and singular priority means that we are going to be removing accounts, and we have okay, done so. I, I'm quoting, actually, um, that you said, from a business perspective, Twitter is incentivized to keep all voices on the platform. Oh, uh, all perspectives, um, but I thought you meant uh, more, more of the accounts, but... We, we do want to make sure that we are in, uh, you know, we, we believe we're used as a public square uh, for people and that all perspectives um, should, rep should be represented. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you. General ladies, time's expired. The chair will recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Bouchon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. I, I, I just want to say I don't think, I don't see this as particularly partisan. And the hearing, I think, is completely appropriate and relevant to the American people across political ideology, as I, I would respectfully disagree with my Democrat colleagues and some of the comments they've made, and I would just like to say this. Ironically, in my view, they're the ones most likely to want heavy-handed government intervention into your industry, and I would argue that people like me, Republicans, are trying to help you avoid it. So take that for what, what it's worth. Um, you know, you've implied and you've said that Twitter's taking all these different actions to improve 
uh, all the things that you're doing as it relates to algorithms and other things. What's your timeline? And, and I know you've said that this is an ongoing process, right? You're never going to, you're not going to get a checkered flag, right? But what's your timeline for, make, for getting some of this really done? We, um, we want to move as fast as possible. Um, and I, I know that's a frustrating answer because it's really hard to predict um, uh, the, these outcomes and, and how long they may take. But uh, it is our singular objective as a company um, in terms of improving the, increasing the health of the public square that, that we're hosting. Yep, thank you. Uh, so how do you, is there any way that users and third parties can verify whether or not their political standards or judgments are embedded accidentally into Twitter's algorithms? I mean, I guess I'm asking is, are your algorithm, algorithms publicly available for, for independent coders to assess whether there is bias, whether it's intended or unintended? Not, not today, but that is, a, that is an area we are looking at, and uh, we'd love to be more open as a company, um, including uh, our, our algorithms and how they work. Uh, we don't yet know the best way to do that. Uh, we, we also have to consider, um, in some cases, when we um, are more clear about how our algorithms work, it allows for gaming of the yeah. system, so people taking advantage of it. Yep. Um, so we need to be cognizant of that, and it's not a blocker by, by any means. Oh, I understand. We love for it to be open, uh, but but that's the big um, that's a big understanding that we need to we need to understand how to crack. Yeah, I totally get that. I could see where if the algorithms were there, then smart people are going to find ways to subvert that, right? Yep. And there's some probably some proprietariness there that you may have a competitor in the future named something else, and you don't want your process is out there. I totally respect although, that. I, although this is an area we don't want to compete. We do not want to compete on health. Yeah, okay. um, we want to share whatever we find. Okay. Uh, and I think many people have said, you know, all of us, whether we know it or not, have some inherent biases based on our, where we grew up, what our background is, what our life experiences are. So I'm kind of, I, I'm really interested in how, how you recruit, you know, to, to your company. Because I think, um, and you, I mean, Obviously, the tech industry has had some criticism about its level of diversity, uh, but I, I think it would be important to kind of get your feel for if you're going to have you're going to avoid groupthink and you're creating algorithms. How do you how do you recruit? And I mean, you're not going to ask somebody, "Hey, are you a pro-Trump or against Trump?" I get that, right? But you want to have I, I would argue you want to have people from everywhere, different races, men, women, different political views. Because our imp my impression is is like diversity. It is in some respects in certain industries fine as long as it's not political diversity. So, how do you? Can you give me a sense of how you kind of build a team? Yeah, th this is an active conversation within the company right now. We we recognize that we need to decentralize our workforce out of San Francisco. Um, not everyone wants to be in San Francisco. Not everyone wants to work in San Francisco, and not everyone can afford to even come close to living in San Francisco, and it's not fair. So we're considering ways of how we hire more broadly across every geography across this country and also around the world, sure. and being a, more, a lot more flexible. It's finally the case that technology is enabling more of that. And uh, we're really excited about this, and I'm personally excited to not consider San Francisco to be a headquarters, but to be a more distributed company. Yeah, I just want to say I think it's very important to make sure that uh, that companies like yours do get a variety of, in, of perspectives within your employee base. Thank you. Agreed. Thanks for being here. Thank yeah, you. Chair, will recognize the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Ruse, for four minutes. Mr. Dorsey, had a long day. You're in the home stretch. So uh, thank you for being with us today. I'm glad my colleagues on uh, this side of the aisle have been focusing on the issues that are very important to our democracy and how we combat foreign influences and bots and harassment and other challenges on your platform. I would like to take a step back and look more precisely at the makeup of Twitter's users, and I'm not sure uh, we or even possibly you have a true understanding of who is really using your services and your website. So as you have said previously, the number of followers an account has is critically important, both in terms of the prominence of an account, uh, but also the ranking of algorithms that push content to users. So when tens of thousands of new accounts created every day, both real and fake, and by humans and bots alike, I'm concerned about the accuracy of those numbers we are using here today and the implications those numbers have. 
So you, you've said that 5% of your accounts are false or spam accounts, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, is that at, how, how do you measure that? Is that at any one time or is that over the course of any one year? How did you come to the conclusion of 5%? Yeah, we, we have various methods of identification, um, most of them um, uh, automations and machine learning algorithms to identify these in real time, looking at the behaviors of those accounts. And so so that's, that's how you identify which ones are false, but how did you come up with a 5% estimate of total users are fake? Well, um, to, it's 5% it's we believe are taking on spammy-like behaviors, which would indicate an automation um, or some sort of coordination uh, to amplify information beyond their earned reach. Okay. Um, so we're looking at behaviors, and that, that so you number just take that number versus the, the total, total num the number total of active, users. and that number has remained fairly consistent over time. Okay. In 2015, you reported that you had 302 million monthly active users on your platform. In 2016, it was 317 million monthly active users. In 2017, 330 million. And then in 2018, you said 335 million monthly active users. How do you define monthly active users? Uh, it's someone who engages with the service within the month. Uh, so is that somebody who tweets or somebody who retweets or somebody who just logs in? Someone who just logs in. Okay. And is it 5% of those yearly numbers that you believe to be spam, of the, somebody who just simply logs in? Yes, who okay. are taking on uh, spam-like behaviors or spam-like factors. And has the 5% been consistent over the years? Uh, it, it has been consistent. Okay. So we have heard reports of hundreds of Twitter accounts run by just one person. It's my understanding that each of those accounts are counted as separate monthly active users. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, good. So my, my concern with these questions is that the number of followers an account has, which is obviously comprised of the subset of those 335 million Twitter users, is an incredibly important metric to your site. And one you even said this morning in front of the Senate presented too much of an inventive for account holders. Um, based on what we've heard, um, though, it appears that the number of followers may not be an accurate representation of how many real people follow any given account. Uh, for example, last year Twitter added roughly 13 million users, but uh, early today you said you are flagging or removing 8 to 10 million per week. How can we be confident the 5% fraudulent account number you are citing is, is accurate? Um, well, we, we're constantly updating um, our numbers and our understanding of our system. and. Uh, and getting better and better at that. We, we do see our work to mitigate. Uh, be, be, before we end time, I'm gonna ask you one question and you can submit the information um, if you don't mind. And that's basically in, in medicine for any screening uh, uh, utility, I'm a doctor, for any screening utility, we use a specificity and sensitivity and that just measures how well your methodology works. Uh, and the higher specificity, the lower false positive you have. The higher sensitivity, the lower false negatives that you have. In this case, you can see the different arguments is how many false positives versus how many false negatives. We're concerned that you're gonna have false negatives with the Russian bots. Some other are concerned that you're false positive and you're taking out people that legitimately should be on there. So if you can report to us what those specificity and sensitivity of your mechanism in identifying bots, I'd really appreciate that. That will give us a sense of where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are. Thank Points you. well made, and gentlemen, time's expired. The chair will go to Mr. Flores from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate uh, Mr. Dorsey you showing up to, uh, to help us today. If you don't mind, I'm gonna run through a bunch of questions that we'll take and ask uh, uh, Twitter to supplementally answer, ask those later, or excuse me, answer those later. And then I have a, a question or two at the close that I would like to try to get asked. Um, our local broadcasters provide a valuable service when it comes to emergency uh, broadcasting uh, or broadcasting of different events that happen. You heard Mr. Burgess earlier talk about uh, the TV station that was attacked this morning and one of the first notice he got was on Twitter. So my question is this, should Twitter be considered a trusted advisor in the emergency alerting system? And how do you manage the intentional or unintentional spread of misinformation or abuse by bad actors on this platform during times of emergency? And you can supplementally um, answer that if you would. And then the next question is, 
this has to do with free speech, free speech and expression. It says, does Twitter proactively review its content to determine whether a user has violated its rules, or is it only done once a, another user voices the concerns? Um, this, the next question is, uh, do you have a set of values that Twitter follows when it makes this, uh, decisions about flag content, or is it done on a case-by-case -case basis in which individuals at Twitter make judgment calls? The um, next one has to do with um, how do you, this is a conceptual question I'd like you know, all to try to answer, and that's how do you balance um, filtering versus free, and moderating versus free speech? I mean, there, there's always this tenuous balance between those two, so you could, I'd like to uh, have you respond to that. Then we need some definition. This is an oversight hearing. We're not trying to legislate. We're just trying to, and not trying to get into fights. We're just trying to, to get over, to uh, learn about the space. And so I, what we'd like to have are Twitter's definitions of behavior, uh, Twitter's definition of hateful conduct, um, Twitter's definition of low quality tweets. Uh, I'd like to, uh, an explanation of the abuse reports proce process. Um, and also you said you had signals for ranking and filtering. I'd like to know how that process works if we can. Uh, I'd like to know more about the Trust and Safety Council, how it works and its membership. Uh, the, some of that's publicly available, some of it's not. And then um, the Twitter definition of suspicious activity. And here's the, the question I have in the last minute that I have that, that I'd like you to respond to today. Um, a lot of the social media space has been through some tumultuous times over the past 18 to 24 months. And so my question is this, if we were to have a hearing a year from now, what would be the three biggest changes that Twitter has made that you would share with Congress? Uh, that's an excellent question. So I, I believe first and foremost, we see a lot of progress on increasing the health of public conversation. Um, second, I believe that we've reduced a bunch of the burden that a victim has to go through in order to report any content uh, that is against them or silencing their voice or um, causing them to not want to participate in the public space in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and then third, we, we have a deeper understanding of um, the real world effects off platform of our service, uh, both uh, to the broader public uh, and also to the individual as well. Um, and um, those, those are things that I, I think we, we can and will make a lot of progress on, the, the, the latter one um, being probably the hardest to determine, but I think we're gonna learn a lot within these um, 2018 elections. Okay, I thank you for your responses. I know you've got team people back there that took good notes on the other ones that I left for supplemental uh, disclosure. Thank you, I yield back. Yields back, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, is recognized for four minutes. Mr. Dorsey, I certainly want to thank you for uh, being here and for uh, really enduring this marathon of questions. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the beginning uh, of this uh, hearing. And Mr. Pallone discussed the need for an independent third party institute to conduct a civil rights audit of Twitter. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure of your answer. It was kind of made to me. Uh, so I asked the question, uh, are you willing to commit to, uh, uh, or, or are you saying that Twitter will consider Mr. Pallone's request? Uh, is that a commitment or is that just a consideration? Yeah, we're, we, are, we, we are willing to commit to working with you and, and staff to understand how to do this best um, in a way that is, uh, that is actually going to show um, what we can track and, and the results, but I think that is a dialogue we need to have. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Chicago is experiencing an epidemic of violence, particularly as it relates to our young people. And uh, Facebook has already been confirmed as an asset uh, that is being uh, used uh, by some of these young people to commit violence. And my question to you is, are you aware of where uh, 
Twitter was used to organize or perpetuate any form of street violence anywhere in the, in the nation, and certainly in, in Chicago? Uh, we, we, we do um, look at cases and reports where people are utilizing Twitter and coordinating um, in, in terms of having uh, off-platform violence. We do have a violent extremist group policy where we do look at off-platform off information to make judgments. And is there an automatic process for the removal of such uh, posts? Yes, so there, there is a reporting process, um, but, but again, it does, it does require right now for removal of posts a, um, a report of the violation. So are they removed, though? What, sorry? Are they removed? How many have been removed? No. We, we have you removed any? Have we removed any? Uh, yeah, we, we do often remove um, content that violates our terms of service. Um, we have a series of enforcement actions um, that uh, ranges from a, a warning to a temporary suspension and removal of the offending tweet all the way to a permanent suspension of the, of the account. All right, and in that regard, do you also uh, have any proactive uh, actions that you have taken to inform local police departments of, of these kind of uh, uh, activities? We, we, do, we do have uh, partnerships with local um, enforcement and uh, law enforcement agencies um, all over the world, uh, and we do inform them as necessary. All right, let me ask you one other final question here. I want to switch. Uh, your legal and policy chief told Politico yesterday that I quote, that there is a, not a blanket exception for the president or anyone else when it comes to abusive tweeting. Uh, do you consider pre President Trump's tweets to be abusive or harmful uh, at all? We, we hold every account to the same standards and consistency of our enforcement. Um, we do have a clause within our terms of service that allows for public interest and understanding of public interest per tweet. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we definitely weigh that as we consider enforcement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my time is... Yeah. yeah. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to submit a statement for the record on behalf of our colleague, Representative Anna Eshoo of California. Without objection, the general lady from Indiana, Ms. Brooks, is recognized for four minutes. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here today and for sitting through um, an entirely very long day of a lot of questions. And um, I want to share with you and stay a little bit on the public safety no, angle. Have, have, uh, um, in 2015, I was very pleased because we got signed into law a Department of Homeland Security Social Media Improvement Act bill. And this group has been meeting, um, which I'm pleased that they organized and have been meeting. They've issued about three different reports. Um, and I'm actually, one of the reports is focused on highlighting countering false information in disasters and emergencies. Um, another one focuses on best, best practices of incorporating social media into their exercises, public safety exercise all the time. And then how do they operationalize social media for public safety? I'd be curious whether or not you and your team, A, if you even knew anything about this group, and whether or not you and your team might be willing to assist this group. Uh, while I recognize that you have um, contacts around the globe, um, there actually is a group, um, social, a public safety social media group that's very focused on this, and I think we need to have better interaction between the social media platforms and organizations and public safety community so they can figure this out. Is that something you might be willing to consider? Yeah, I, I was not aware of it, honestly, but um, I'm sure my team is and will definitely consider it. Thank you. Um, I, I am curious, um, and I asked uh, Mr. Zuckerberg this when he appeared before us, uh, with respect to the terrorism groups and the extremist groups that you monitor and that you take down, and I have seen reports that in a short period of time, July of 17 to December of 17, you actually took down 274,460 Twitter accounts 
in a six-month period relative to promoting terrorism. And so that seems like a very large number of accounts, and I'm afraid that people believe that it's not happening, we don't hear about it as much. Um, can you talk, and I understand that you've worked with Google, YouTube, Facebook, and others to create a shared database of prohibited videos and images, um, but we don't hear anything about that either. Um, is this database still in use? Are you all still working together and collaborating? Yeah, we, we are still working together, and, and this is a, a very active collaboration. And um, and a lot of you know the work we've been doing over years continues to bear a, a lot of fruit here. But we're happy to send to the committee um, more detailed uh, results. We do have this in our transparency report. And I was going to ask, the transparency report, and you've talked about that a few times, it's not done yet, is that right? It's not finished yet for um, actions upon uh, content and accounts um, that have to do with uh, our health aspects. It, it is uh, for terrorism uh, accounts. It is finished there. All of these questions that you've gotten, and there have been a lot of things, are can we expect that a lot of these things might be in that transparency report that people have been asking you about? Yeah, the, the first step is to figure out what is most meaningful to put in there. So really designing the document um, so that um, people can get a meaningful insight in terms of how we're doing and what we're seeing and what we're dealing with. And, um, and then we need to aggregate all that data. So we're in the early phases of designing this document and how we are thinking about it. Um, but we'd like to move fast on it because we do believe it will help earn trust. Well, and certainly from a public safety perspective, you can't and shouldn't divulge everything that you do relative to helping keep us safe. And while I appreciate that it is very important to have a, an open dialogue and to have uh, the, as much information as possible in the conversation in the public square, I, I certainly hope that your work with law enforcement, um, we need to make sure that the bad guys don't understand what you're doing to help us. And so I thank you and look forward to your continued work in this space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Generally, time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Costello, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. In your testimony, you identified a handful of behavioral signals, but you noted Twitter uses thousands of behavioral signals in your behavioral-based ranking models. Could you provide the committee with a complete accounting of all of these signals? Uh, we. A lot of those um, signals are changing constantly. So even if we present one today, it might change within a week or within a month. Um, the, the point is that it's not um, a thousand behavioral signals, it's a thousand uh, decision-making criteria and signals that the algorithms use. And, and I don't mean exactly a thousand, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands. They all vary would um, you, to actually make decisions. Would you uh, consider providing a more expansive list of signals beyond the small handful that you have pre provided, specifically those that seem to endure and that don't change week to week? We're, we're looking at ways to uh, open up um, um, how our algorithms work and what criteria they use to make decisions. We, we don't have conclusions just yet, and the reason why um, we're pausing a little bit here and considering is because by giving up certain criteria, we may be enabling more gaming of the system and taking advantage sure. of the system so that people can bypass our protections. You used the term a little earlier, um, curators. Is that a term, is that, is that a position within your company or did you just kind of, could you share, sh what's a curator at your company do? Yeah, we have a, we have a product um, within Twitter called Moments. And what it is is if you go to the search icon, you can see a collection of tweets that are actually arranged by humans, organized around a particular event or a topic. So it might be a sporting game, for example. And we have curators who are looking for um, all the tweets that would be relevant. And one of the things that um, they want to ensure is that we're seeing a bunch of different perspectives. Rele on relevant on. based on my behavior, and do I have to manually do that, or is that going to show up in my feed? It, it's a, we, we do that work, uh, and then sometimes you may get a moment that is more personalized to you based on your behavior. Uh, in some cases, all people get the same moment. Would that be subject, and listen, I know the, the, the bias issue, uh, but uh, would that, that would open up consideration for there to be more bias in any way. Bias can mean a lot of different things. It doesn't even have to be political. That's, so your curators 
are making some sort of subjective determination on what might be of interest, what might pop more, what might get more retweets, comments, well, et cetera? They, they use a data-driven approach based on the percentage of conversation that people are seeing. Um, so we're, we're trying to reflect how much this is being talked about on the network first and foremost, and then checking it against impartiality and also um, making sure that we are increasing the variety of perspective. I appreciated your testimony, uh, your written testimony. You said something in there that interests me, and that a lot of things. But one was, you have no incentive to remove people from your platform. In other words, there, you have no incentive to remove conservatives from your platform, because the more people talking, the better. But it strikes me that in when we're talking about hate speech or personal insults or things that are just m straight up mean, um, there's kind of an in, there's an incentive not to remove that stuff if it's driving more um, participation. How do you reconcile that? It's an excellent question, and and something that we have balanced uh, in terms of number one, our singular objective is to increase the health of this public square, and and this public space, and we realize that in the short term that will mean removing accounts, and we. We do believe that increasing the health of the public conversation on Twitter is a growth vector for us, but only in the long term. And we, you know, over the, over the past few months, we've taken a lot of actions to remove accounts in mass. Uh, we reported this during our, during our past earnings call. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the reaction was what it was, but we did that because we believe that over the long term, these are the right moves so that we can right. continue to serve a healthy uh, public Gentlemen, place. time. Yep, thank you. I yield back. J Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, before. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Dorsey, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I've got a question, and this isn't an I got you question. It's a point that to which I, I want to try to make because I, as my colleague from uh, Virginia, uh, Mr. Griffith said earlier, doesn't believe that you're doing it on purpose. It's just that the way things are working out, the the, the system to which you guys um, use to figure out who's going to be censored and who's not. So my question is, w would you consider yourself conservative, liberal, socialist? How would you how would you consider your political views? Um, I I try to focus on the issues, so I don't find. Well, I know, uh, but the issues are at hand, and that's what I'm trying to ask. Um, what what issues in particular? Well, okay, if you're not going to ask, are you a registered voter? I am a registered voter. Republican, Democrat, Independent, Independent. So, you know, as a business owner myself, um, different departments that I have seem to take on. The, the personality of the ones that I have running it. The people that I have running an apartment uh, or a business or an organization, the, when I stepped down as CEO of my company, the new CEO took on a different personality and the employees followed. And, and we're, we're choosing one mindset over another in some way, regardless if you're doing it on purpose or not. The way that it is being picked, the way it's being portrayed, is, is somewhat obvious. And let me just simply make my point here. Um, 2016 presidential com campaign, the, the Twitter, or Twitter uh, was accused of suspending an anti-Hillary-focused account and de-emphasized popular hashtags. October 2017, Twitter barred Marsha Blackburn's campaign video for an ad platform calling it inflammatory. Uh, November 2017, Rogue, a single Rogue employee, deactivated Trump's account for 11 minutes. That's shocking that a single Rogue employee could actually have that much authority to do that. That's a different question for a different day, maybe. Uh, 20, or July 2018, Twitter was accused of limiting visibility of certain Republican politicians by preventing their official accounts from appearing in sites. Uh, Auto-populated drop-down searches, search bar results. August 27, or 2018, conservative activist Candace Owens' account was, was suspended after essentially imitating an account from a New York Times editorial board member, Susan, I think I'm pronouncing this right, Jong. Are you familiar with this? Yes. Let me read what, 
what Miss Jong wrote. Hashtag cancel white people. White people marking up the internet with their opinions like dogs pissing on fire hydrants. Are white people genetically predisposed to burn faster in the sun, thus logically being only fit to live underground like graveling goblins? Oh man, it's kind of sick how much I enjoy or how much joy I get out of being cruel to old white man. I open my mouth to populate or to politely greet a Republican, but nothing but an unending cascade of vomiting flows from my mouth. Now that same tweet went out by Candace Owens, but replaced Jewish for white. Miss Owens' account was suspended and flagged. The New York Times reporter account wasn't. What's the difference? We, so we did make a mistake uh, with uh, Owens. But I've heard you say that multiple times, we made a mistake. We made a mistake. I've heard you say that the whole time you've been up here and you've been very polite and pretty awesome at doing it. But the fact is it's bigger than a mistake. It's the environment to which I think Twitter has. My point of the first question was, does that fit your political views to which your company is following? Because there seems no, to be a pattern here. No, it doesn't. It, I, I value variety and perspective, and I value seeing uh, people from all walks of life and all points of views. And we do make errors along the way, both in terms of our algorithms and also the people who are following guidelines to review content. That Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. And it's been a long day for you. Um, it's an important day, though. Uh, I guess the only only complaint I would have thus far is that uh, your staff didn't uh, prepare well enough to go through 535 members of Congress to see if there were any biases and have those figures for us today that you could answer. I would assume that they should have thought that uh, that with Republicans and Democrats here and the statements that we've heard from the other side of the aisle, that that question would come up, those facts, those statistics, at least on the members, uh, 535 members, would have been worth being able to answer right today with an imperative, uh, no, there was no bias, or yes, it appears there was a bias. That's the only complaint I have. But let me, let me uh, go to the questions. In, in a July 26 blog post, Twitter asserted, and I quote, we believe the issue had more to do with how other people were interacting with these representative accounts. What specific signals or actions of other accounts interacting with the representative's account would you suggest, this is my question, contributed to the auto-suggest issue? Uh, the behaviors we were seeing were vi actual violations of our terms of service. Clear violations of your terms. W would, would muting or blocking another user's account con contribute to that? No. No, these, these were reported violations that we reviewed and found in violation. And retweeting or boosting wouldn't be a contribution to what you did either. No. Um, does Twitter have policies and procedures in place to notify accounts or users when their messages or content have been hidden from other users? Um, we, we don't have enough of this, um, so we, we don't. We, we do have a lot of work to do to help people understand why, um, right in the product, why we might uh, rank or why we might filter or put their content behind in their citral. Um, and that is an area of improvement. So we, we haven't done enough work there. So while, while, and I appreciate the fact you don't, you don't want to have users be responsible for contacting you about issues, you ought to be catching some of this stuff. You have no specific timeline or, or strong policy in place to notify me, for instance, that there's a reason why you've taken me down, blocked or whatever for the time being, so I can at least respond to that and can make a change so that I'm a productive, positive member of, of, uh, of, uh, of Twitter. Well, if we take any enforcement action that results in removal of content or asking to removal, you get notified immediately. It's just a question of fil the filtering or the town ranking that we don't have uh, a great way of doing this today. 
it is our intention to look deeper into this, but, um, and I know this is a frustrating answer, but the, the timelines are a little bit unpredictable, um, but we, we do believe that transparency is an important concept for us to push because we want to earn more people's trust. With regard to internet service providers, they're required uh, to disclose if they are throttling or blocking their services. Of course, that's been a big issue. Would you be open to a similar set of transparency rules when you have taken actions that could be viewed as blocking or throttling of content? We, we are um, considering a uh, transparency report around our actions regarding content like this. Um, we're in the phases right now of understanding what is going to be most useful in designing the document, and then we have to do the engineering work to put it in place so we can aggregate all the information. But I, I do think it's a good idea and, and something that I do think helps earn people's trust. Well, I wish you well on it, because I don't, don't want to be, be like my colleagues on the other side of the aisle that want to regulate. Uh, this is the amazing social media opportunity we have. We want to keep it going, keep it going proper. But I don't want to see government get involved in regulating if you folks can do the job yourselves. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Duncan for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, <clears throat> Ms. Dorsey, thank you for being here. We've heard a lot today about content filters, shadow banning, and a little bit about bias. And I'd like to focus on bias for just a second. A member of my staff recently created a test Twitter account working on a communications project unrelated to this topic and even before we knew that this hearing was going to take place. They were interested uh, to note who was listed on the suggestions for you uh, to follow list. This is the pro-life conservative congressional staffer on a work computer whose search history definitely doesn't lean left. All they entered was an email address and a 202 area code phone number. Yet here's who Twitter suggested they follow, and you'll see it on the screen. Nancy Pelosi, Kamala Harris, John Dingell, Chuck Schumer, John Kerry, Ben Rhodes, David Axelrod, Kirsten Gillibrand, Jim Acosta, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, Paul Krugman, uh, Madeleine Albright, Claire McCaskill, Chuck Todd, and John Lovett. All left-wing political types. That's all she got is suggested for you to follow. Forget the fact that there are any Republicans or conservatives on that list. No singers, no actors, no athletes, no celebrities. She's a 20-something female staffer, didn't even get Taylor Swift, Chris Pratt, Cristiano Ronaldo, or Kim Kardashian. All she got was the suggestions that I had on the screen. Look, it's one thing not to pro promote conservatives, even though Donald Trump is the truly the most successful Twitter user in history of the site. Say what you want about what he tweets, but President Trump has utilized Twitter in unprecedented ways to get around to traditional news media. I would think that someone in your position would be celebrating that and him rather than trying to undermine him. So how do you explain how a female 20-something year old who just put in an email address and a 202 area code, how, why does she only get the liberal suggestions? We, we simply don't have enough information in that case to build up a more informed um, suggestion for him, so for her. So the, the 202 number is all we have, so therefore... So I get that you don't have much information on her. 100% of the suggested followers were biased. Where was Kim Kardashian? Huge Twitter... Where was Taylor Swift? Where was Ariana Grande? In fact, I can look at Twitter most followers, and they're not these people that you suggested for her. And there was nothing in her on her search history and on a government work computer to suggest that she was left-leaning, right-leaning, or anything. Um, Katy Perry, number one. She went on this list. I, How do you explain that? I think it was just looking at the 202 as a DC number and then taking DC-based accounts, and the most followed probably or most engaged with DC accounts. As, as in the 202 area code area? In the 202 area. Okay. I, where's Bryce Harper? Where's Ovechkin? Where are the Capitals? Where are the, uh, the Nats? Um, where's DC United? Where are the sports teams? If you're going to use 202 area code and say that's one of the filters, where are those folks? You know, outside of the political arena, there are no athletes, there are no uh, singers, there are no celebrities. There were only suggested political figures of a very liberal persuasion that were suggested for her to follow. Nobody else. That shows bias, sir. 
Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, we do have a lot more work to do in terms of our onboarding, and obviously you're pointing out some weaknesses in our, in our signals that we use to craft those recommendations. Um, so I, you know, as, as she continues, if, if she were to start following or following particular accounts or engaging uh, with particular tweets, that model would completely change uh, based on those. Um, we just don't have enough information. It sounds like we are not being exhaustive enough with the one piece of information we do have, which is her, her area code. Mr. Dorsey, let me ask you uh, this. Sure. After this hearing, and, and me clearly showing this bias and a lot of other questions, if someone in a 202 area code that's 28 years old sets up a Twitter account with very limited information but has an email address and a 202 area code, Moments. Are you going to tell me today that they're going to get other suggested followers than the liberals that I mentioned? That, that is not a good outcome for us. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair recognizes the lady you. from California, Ms. Walters, for four minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dorsey, for being here. Um, news reports indicate that Periscope, as you know, is Twitter's live video feed app, uh, is being used to sexually exploit children. Uh, these reports detail the targeting of children as young as nine years old. At times, coordinated activity from multiple users is employed to persuade children to engage in sexual behavior. These videos can be live streamed in public or private broadcasts on Periscope. I recognize that a live video app like Periscope creates challenges, especially when attempting to monitor content in real time. Yet your testimony discussing malicious election-related activity on Twitter reads, Quote, we strongly believe that any such activity on Twitter is unacceptable. I hope that standard of unacceptability is similarly applied to sexual exploitation of children on Periscope. And I would expect that it is, considering that Twitter has stated zero tolerance policy for child sexual exploitation. So my questions are, does Twitter primarily rely on users to report sexually inappropriate content or content concerning child safety? Uh, we, we, we do have uh, some dependency on, on reports, um, but this is an area that we want to move much faster in automating and, uh, and not obviously placing the blame or not placing the work on the, the victim um, and making sure that we are recognizing these in real time and we have made some progress with Periscope. So what is the average length of a live video on Periscope? Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of that right now, but we can, we can follow up. Okay. And what is the average response time to remove a live video on Periscope that is deemed to violate Twitter's term of service? It depends uh, entirely on the severity of the report and, uh, and what the context is. Um, so we try to prioritize um, by severity, so uh, threats of, of death or uh, suicidal tendencies would get a higher priority than everything else. So just out of curiosity, when you say we, we try to eliminate and we have a, we have a higher priority, um, like who makes that decision? Uh, we, we have, um, so when people report any violations of our terms of service, we have algorithms looking at the report and then trying to understand how to prioritize those reports so they're seen by humans much faster. Okay. Um, so I would assume that you don't believe that user reporting is an effective method for monitoring live videos on Periscope then? Not, not over the long term. Well, obviously, this is a really, really important issue. Um, is user reporting an effective method for monitoring private broadcasts on Periscope? Um, also not over the long term, uh, but that, that is something that we, um, we need to do much more work around in terms of automating these. So can you uh, indicate that you, you need to do some more work around this? Um, do you have any time frame of when you think you'll be able to get this handled? Uh, we, we'd like to work as, as quickly as possible and make sure that we are prioritizing the uh, proactive approaches of our enforcement. And again, it, it does go down that prioritization stack, but um, we, we intend to move as quickly as we can. I, I know that it's frustrating not to hear a particular time frame, but um, we, are, we are moving fast. Can you explain the type of technology that you're, you're using in order to change this? Yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be utilizing a lot of machine learning and deep learning uh, in order to look at um, all of our systems at scale and then also prioritize the, um, the, the, the right uh, review cadence. Okay, uh, I yield back my balance of my time. Thank you. Now I yield back. Chair recognizes.
Mr. Carter, Georgia, our last uh, member to participate. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Four Mr. Minutes. Chairman. And Mr. Dorsey, congratulations. I'm the last one. Um, Mr. Dorsey, in preparation for this hearing, I sent out a notice throughout my district and I asked them, I, I, I let them know that I, we were here having this hearing and I was going to be asking questions. And I said, what do you think I ought to ask him? So I got back some pretty interesting responses for that. And one of them came from a, from a teenage high school student, a conservative teenage high school student down in Camden County. That's right on the Georgia, Florida state line. And, and uh, he said, he said, you know, I'm a conservative teenage high school student, and I, I've got, uh, I'm on Twitter, and I've got over 40,000 followers. Yet I have tried, this, this young man had tried five times to get verification, and yet he's been turned down all five times. And his question to me was, I, I've got friends who are more liberal than me, who've got less followers than me, and yet they've been verified. Why is that? What should I tell him? So we, um, first and foremost, we, we believe we need a complete reboot of our verification system. It's not serving us, it's not serving the people that we serve well. Um, we, it, it really depends on when his friends were verified. We had an open verification system uh, not too long ago that looked for various criteria and we verified people based on that. And it's not a function of how many followers you have. We have some verified folks who only have 5,000 followers. Uh, we, that was his point. I mean, he had yeah. 40,000, he couldn't, under, and he doesn't understand. I don't know what to tell him. I mean, yeah. you know, it seems to me like he would have been verified. And from what he explained to me and to staff is that they were, they applied at the same time. Yeah. So it, why was he denied and they were approved? I, I, I would need to understand his particular case. So I would want to know um, his name and we'll I'll be glad and we you will on. get the, you that information because I'd like to get the young man a, an explanation. Okay. I think he deserves it. Okay. Uh, and let me ask you something, and, and I apologize, but being the last one, sometimes you're a little bit redundant. But you were asked earlier because, you know, this committee, and particularly the HELP subcommittee, has been the tip of the spear, if you will, with the opioid crisis that we have in our country. As you're aware, we're losing 115 people every day to opioid addiction. And, and we just talked about the algorithms, and, and you've been talking about it all day about, you know, why is it, why is it that we haven't been able to get these sites off? What, what's missing? I mean, what are you identifying that you're missing not to be able to get these, these tweets off? I, I don't know if it's, um, I think it's more of a, a, a new um, behavior, a new approach. Um, it's, this has been going on quite a while. It's certainly not an excuse. Um, we need to look at these more deeply in terms of like how our algorithms are automatically determining um, uh, when we see this sort of activity and taking action must fa much faster. Okay, fair enough. My last question is this, and I wanna talk about um, intellectual property, particularly as it relates to, to live streaming. Now you've been here all day. You were over at the Senate this morning, you've been here this afternoon, and all day long, this, you know, you've been saying, and, and we have no other reason but to believe you, yeah, we need to work on this. We're going to work on this. We, the, the piracy that takes place with, with live streaming movies and intellectual property like that, that's been going on for quite a while, hasn't it? It has. Why should I believe you? And we had another CEO of another um, social media that was here a couple of months ago. You know, same thing. We're working on it. We're going to get it done. But yet, this is something that's been going on. You ain't got it done yet. Why, why should I believe you now? And, and I say that because, you know, Dr. Bouchon, Representative Wahlberg, I echo their comments. I don't want the federal government to get into this business. I don't want to regulate you guys. I, I think it'll stifle innovation. But why should I believe you if you, you haven't got this fixed? Yeah, well, the, the reason we have to still work on it is because the methods of attack constantly change. And we'll never arrive at one solution that fixes everything. We need to constantly iterate based on new vectors of stealing IP or rebroadcasting IP, for instance, because they're constantly changing. And we just need to be 10 steps ahead of that. Uh, you know, I, I want to believe you and, and I'm going to believe you, but I, I just have to tell you, I hope you believe me. We, we don't want the federal government, and you don't want the federal government being this. I think the success of, of the internet and, and of, of your products has been because the federal government stayed out of it. But we've got to have help. 
And we have to have a commitment. And when I look at this, I think, why, why would I believe them if they've been working on this and hadn't even got it fixed yet? Absolutely. Gentlemen's time. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I yield. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, while we've been sitting here, I'm told that Twitter has deleted the account that was trying to sell drugs online. So your team has been at work. We appreciate that. Um, we have exhausted probably you and your team and our members' questions for now. Um, we do have some letters and questions for the, uh, for the record, uh, including script. Um, and so I, I again want to thank you for being here before the committee. Um, some of our members, you know, didn't get to all their questions, and so we will be submitting those uh, for the record. And we have a number of uh, things we'd like to insert in the record by unanimous consent, a letter from Encompass, Consumer Technology Association, and the Internet Association, an article from Gizmodo, an article from Inc., a paper by Kate Klonick, an article from NBC, an article from Slate, an article from The Verge. Uh, and pursuant to committee rules, I remind members they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. I ask the witness submit their response within 10 business days upon receipt of that question. We ask you remain um, seated until the Twitter team is able to exit. So if you all remain seated, thank you, then our folks from Twitter can leave. And Mr. Dorsey, thank you again for being before the Energy and Commerce Committee. And with that, the thank subcommittee you. is adjourned.